The Atheist Debates Patreon Project presents Did Jesus Rise from the Dead? A debate between Matt Delante and Blake Junta. The following debate took place August 6, 2016 and was sponsored by the Bible and Beer Consortium in Dallas, Texas. Tonight's topic, Did Jesus Rise from the Dead? Before I introduce tonight's speakers, please listen carefully. Blake and Matt have communicated that they want to very carefully protect the cordial atmosphere of tonight's discussion. This isn't a debate between enemies, but between friends who love to talk about the subject. I think you're going to see the respect these two have for each other, and we want to emulate that as an audience. So Blake and Matt have requested a strict no cheering policy. This doesn't mean that after Blake or Matt present their initial positions, You don't erupt with applause. Please do. Let's practice that. Ladies and gentlemen, Blake Junta. Ladies and gentlemen, Matt Dillahunty. That is a quite feculent response, but we'll work on it. Now, to be clear, we are not demanding... We're expecting complete silence. People are going to politely applaud. Politely applaud. Or groan. Or even laugh. Some of you, after all, are drinking beer. But this isn't the Roman Colosseum. Are we clear? This doesn't mean that after Matt tells a good joke, you don't laugh. Again, please do. But, per Mr. Dillahunty, no one in this room is allowed to make Matt Dillahunty look bad. He alone has that privilege. (laughs) Tonight's first speaker is Blake Junta. Blake is founder of beliefmap.org a dialogue simulator designed to map points and counterpoints in debates on issues like God's existence and Jesus' resurrection. He's been studying philosophy and apologetics as an enthusiast for over a decade. Blake is also a Texas state champion wrestler, but mostly enjoys beating people at StarCraft and Halo. (laughs) Speaking to the topic, did Jesus rise from the dead, Please welcome Blake Junta. Well, hey, guys. uh, Glad you're here. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've been looking forward to this debate for a long time. Uh, Two reasons. First, we get to have Matt back, which is awesome. I think he's going to come down so we can see uh, our slideshow here. And uh, second, in my opinion, we're debating the most important topic we can. Christianity can survive even if there are a thousand Bible contradictions. But as Paul says, quote, if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is in vain. And yet if Jesus did rise, well, uh, we're going to get to that. So I have a lot to share with you guys, and I'm just going to jump right in. My argument tonight is very simple. It goes like this. Step one, shortly after Jesus' death, disciples and enemies of his were proclaiming God has raised Jesus. He just met with us. And step two is simply going to argue that they were right. They weren't lying or deceived. And so how do we establish step one? Tonight, we only have time to look at two sources. The first is the 1 Corinthians 15 Creed. So this book uh, is a 718-page doctoral dissertation on the appearance evidence for the resurrection that we're going to be talking about tonight. And these 13 pages are the summary of contemporary scholarship on this creed. And you can see from all the citations that a lot of research has been done on this. So what is this creed? Well, contextually, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and he says, you guys, you know our creedal statement, that Christ died and that he was buried, then raised, and then he, that he appeared to Peter and then to the 12 apostles. And what's powerful about this creed is that literally over 99% of scholars accept that it circulated from the beginning of the Jesus movement. 
For example, the Jesus Seminar consists of about 150 non-Christian New Testament scholars, and they conclude, quote, on the assumption that Jesus died about 30 CE, the time for development was thus two or three years at most. The Oxford Companion to the Bible. It is certainly not later than Paul's visit to Jerusalem in 35 CE. And it is widely accepted that this creed was formed in Jerusalem. And this is why it is so commonly said that this creed can be considered a statement of eyewitnesses. The evidence unilaterally puts the apostles in Jerusalem around AD 30, proclaiming that Jesus really appeared to them. And we can reach the same conclusion with our second source. Acts chapter 2 records a famous speech given by Peter to a crowd in Jerusalem. So this is just after Jesus' crucifixion. It's a huge festival, and the apostles are proclaiming that, quote, this Jesus God raised up, to which we are all witnesses. Is that true, though? Did they really say this? To build our trust in Acts 2, I'm going to give four reasons to trust Luke Acts in general. Now, if you don't know already, the books of Luke and Acts together are called Luke Acts because it's a two-volume work by the same author. Now, whether the author is actually Luke, uh, Professor Brown says scholarship's evenly divided. But no one denies that they have the same author. Tonight, we're just going to call him Fred. In Luke 1.1, Fred says his material has been carefully grounded in eyewitness testimony. And for several reasons, quote, this biographical understanding of the gospel genre has now become the accepted scholarly consensus. Fred claims to have used eyewitness testimony. In fact, guys, in Acts 21, Fred says he personally joins Paul during Paul's third visit to Jerusalem where all the witnesses are. He says, quote, after we arrived in Jerusalem, the brethren received us. If he's telling the truth about this, you're going to see that we have a very good case for the Acts 2 speech. Now, there is no reason to think that Fred's lying, but we can start to check anyways by seeing if he really uses Paul as an eyewitness like he says. We're going to see that Fred actually traveled with Paul and knew verifiable things that he could have only have gotten from Paul. So, first, remember, Fred just said, we arrived in Jerusalem. So, and while there, Paul is arrested, but he ends up invoking his right as a Roman citizen to go on trial in Rome. And then Fred says, quote, we put out to sea, and they started from Jerusalem, went to Caesarea, to Sidon, to Myra, and from there, they transferred to an, a Greek Alexandrian grain ship. So some background here. Uh, as Fred said earlier, there was a famine, quote, during the reign of Claudius. We verified this. And we know that Claudius established this grain fleet that would truck up to 150,000 tons of corn from a Greek city called Alexandria in Egypt. So anyway, the Roman centurion transfers these prisoners to one of these Alexandrian grain ships, and they end up at Crete. So now, as a taste of the authenticity of this voyage, uh, let me give you five evidences. First, from here at Crete, they're trying to get from this green dot or to the blue dot. And as they, quote, sailed along Crete close to the shore, soon a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster struck down from the land. And here is our first evidence. This is a well-confirmed wind that rides over Crete from the northeast, strongest at this exa exa excuse me, exact time near Passover. Here's our second evidence. Fred says, quote, we were driven to a small island called Kada. Now, what's impressive here is that this purple dot island is about 90 miles from the green dot. And ancients found it nearly impossible to properly locate islands this far out. So Ptolemy and Pliny had the estimates in Fred's day and both would have been thought at the time to debunk Fred's claim here. However, it's Fred's report alone that gets the implied location of the island right. Hemer says, quote, it becomes increasingly difficult to believe that such details could have been derived from any kind of contemporary reference work. Our third evidence is the accurate fear of running aground on the shoals of Sirtis. And fourth, we know Fred is carefully describing in layman's terms uh, various measures taken by the crew, and yet Fred describes them without necessarily understanding them. So, so, for example, Fred says ropes were wrapped around the ship, but he's clueless about how desperate these measures were. Fifth, scholars have written on these Latin nautical terms that have made their way into Fred's account. 
But how is Fred hearing Roman language on a ship of Alexandria? Isn't that dumb? No, Alexandrian ships, remember, are under the imperial service at this time, which Fred didn't even tell us. And a centurion with prisoners like Paul would be able to get on. Keener says it would be the fastest way to get to Rome. And this is just a taste. I'm going quick, and I've had to cut out 90% of the travel evidence. We can show that Fred has a Pauline knowledge of the world as well. Remember that prior to this voyage, Fred was traveling all over the world. We can also show, excuse me, back up here. Yeah, so this guy dedicated his life to proclaiming how Jesus appeared to him and transformed him. So this is the newest commentary on Acts published by Baker Academic, and it cites 45,000 extra biblical references. There's obviously no way to summarize all this, but in a nutshell, Fred's account identifies 110 individuals by name, several of which are verified through some extra biblical source. And not only that, he gets the details about them right. For example, as the Oxford Companion to the Bible points out, quote, scholars have drawn attention to the accuracy with which officials are designated by their correct titles, an accuracy the more noteworthy because some of those titles changed from time to time. So at Cyprus, Fred rightly calls the magistrate a proconsul, but at a different time, he'd be called an imperial legate or proprietor. Fred also accurately references 32 countries, 54 cities and nine islands, and there's more. F Paul's evangelism and realistic travel itinerary fits eyewitness acquaintance based on geography, specific ports and what you see when arriving, local customs, time of the year, the status of the church's expansion at that time, and more. Trites and Larkin explain, quote, he is given high marks, even by skeptical critics, for his factual fastidiousness when it comes to geographical, social, and political minutia. It is anachronistic to take this accuracy simply as the result of the kind of research a good historical novelist would do. In the first century, there were no reference works that would make such research possible. And it's not just these random trivia facts. The Book of Acts gets right what scholars call the local color. So for example, this building is the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus. And Fred accurately captures the Ephesians' current economic concerns for that very temple as well as the Ephesians' unique way of saying God, the likely presence of silversmiths in the relevant area, their local concern for defending the Artemis cult, and the very real tendency of Ephesians to riot and drag people to the theater. And again, this is just a taste. You've got stuff like this for almost every city, including the small ones, just as if Fred really did get his information from Paul. One specialist uh, insults the book of Acts and yet confesses, quote, but any attempt to reject its basic historicity, even in matters of detail, must now appear absurd. The final evidence for Fred working with Paul is this. Fred also had a Pauline knowledge of Paul's personal life. Quick example, in Galatians, Paul recounts how he used to persecute the church. However, quote, after a revelation of Jesus Christ, and watch the red text here, I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. After three years, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Peter. And I stayed with him 15 days. But, Paul admits, I did not see any of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, but only they kept hearing, he who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. Now, if you take Paul's letter and compare it to Fred's account, you'll see what's clearly the same series of events. Paul persecutes Christians, heads for Damascus, Jesus appears to him on the way, converts him. Paul later goes to Jerusalem to see if the church leaders are to see the church leaders there for the first time, and they know of Paul by reputation. So they agree on all that. But Fred's detailed account seems to have no awareness of those juicy red details. And this fits the scholarly consensus that Paul's letters weren't collected together at this time for Fred to use. And the best explanation of this tacky sort of correspondence is simply that Fred knew Paul. He didn't need or use the letters. So with these three evidences, we have a good case that Fred was not lying about working with Paul. So Luke Acts claims to be grounded in eyewitness testimony from Jerusalem. Certainly we've confirmed that with Paul's life. They were there together. And here's our third evidence that Fred knew and used Jerusalem witnesses, which again will get us, Acts, will get us Peter's Acts 2 speech. 
which in turn is our second source for establishing step one, that the apostles were really proclaiming Jesus met with us. So in 2002, a new lexicon came out. And looking at all these uh, inscriptions on tombs, we've put together a sort of telephone book of 3,000 Jewish names in Jesus' time and the people who bore them. So a professor at Cambridge University used this new material to test John, Mark, Matthew, and Luke Acts to see if the names lined up with Palestinian names in the way that eyewitness testimony would. Well, what names are popular and to what degree at this exact time and place? It turns out the ratios match gloriously with the Gospels and Acts, and correspondence like this would be, quote, impossible to explain as the result of such invention out of Jewish Palestine, end quote. For example, uh, if you compare the Gospels and Acts with the Jewish names in Egypt or anywhere else, this gorgeous correspondence gets obliterated. So this too should boost our confidence in Fred and the Acts 2 speech. This was a very famous speech, and Acts reports that many Christians in Jerusalem and those visiting for Pentecost trace their conversion to it. Frankly, every church knew full well whether the apostles were saying that Jesus appeared to them or not, because they would be checking with each other. Every Christian wanted to be in, agree in agreement with Jesus' apostles, and Jesus' apostles wanted them to be. But, interesting twist, we didn't need any of that Fred stuff to know the Acts 2 speech traces to the Jerusalem apostles. The speech, quote, exhibits Semitic features and primitive characteristics that we can trace to the congregation at Jerusalem. The Oxford Bible Commentary says it, quote, falls into a distinctive pattern analyzed in Dodd's classic study. And now Dodd was a professor at Cambridge. He didn't say that we can know Peter gave this speech just from these details. But he says we can know, quote, with some confidence that it represents, quote, the kerygma. Uh, this is the kernel preaching of the church at Jerusalem at an early period. So I don't have the exact numbers, but Byerskog says the consensus of New Testament scholars has moved away from skepticism to a general acknowledgement that Fred depends on earlier material for this speech. He didn't just make it up. And of course, this too builds into Fred's reliability. So we have a good case for the Acts 2 speech and its charismatic message in general, meaning the apostles really were historically testifying that, quote, he appeared to us. And everyone knew that's what they were saying. Let me add that contextually, Acts 2 represents an appearance of them to them as a group. We can get everything we need, including group appearances, without even mentioning the Gospels. We got it from the 1 Corinthians 15 Creed as well, remember, that Jesus appeared to Peter by himself and then the 12 as a group, which also fits Fred's first account, by the way. He appeared to Peter and then to the rest of the apostles. So, step one Shortly after Jesus' death, disciples and enemies of his really were proclaiming, God raised Jesus, he just met with us. Step two, they were right. So for example, they weren't lying. The apostles weren't maliciously trying to turn the world against the true God. They got nothing and sacrificed everything because they were convinced. Gary Habermas writes, quote, on the state of resurrection studies today, I recently completed an overview of more than 1,400 sources on the resurrection of Jesus published since 1975. I studied and cataloged about 650 of these texts in English, German, and French. Some of the results of this study are certainly intriguing. For example, perhaps no fact is more widely recognized than that early Christian believers had real experiences that they thought were appearances of the risen Jesus. A critic may claim what they saw were hallucinations or visions, but he does not deny that they actually experienced something. The apostles lost their Messiah to crucifixion, and then suddenly, something changed them. Paula Fredrickson is an expert on this. She echoes the sentiment of literally every non-Christian who teaches on early Christianity. Quote, I don't know what they saw, but I do know as an historian that they must have seen something. This picture of, is a picture of Stephen getting stoned, by the way, which every Christian knew was a real possibility right from the beginning. Jesus faced it, Paul faced it, and Paul himself oversaw stonings. The go-to academic dictionary on Jesus says, quote, all historians are confident that very shortly after Jesus was crucified, his disciples became convinced 
by multiple visionary appearances of Jesus, that God, and they believed that God had restored his life. So they were at least convinced of what they saw. They weren't lying. But did Jesus fake his death and pretend that he resurrected? So I run uh, beliefmap.org, which is sort of a flow chart on steroids. And inside, you can explore this debate over Jesus' resurrection. And since time is short, I'm just giving you a preview. First, uh, Jesus would look half dead. The apostles would know instantly what happened. They'd, they'd be screaming for a doctor. As Strauss says, quote, it could by no possibility have changed their sorrow into enthusiasm, have elevated their reverence into worship. Second, on Belief Map, you're going to see four reasons Jesus wouldn't even try. Third, escaping the tomb from inside was impossible. And fourth, Jesus demonstrably died on the cross. No one survives crucifixion. On Belief Map, you can see one, two, three, four proofs for this, which I think are rather compelling put together. So this theory was popular in German, in German New Testament scholarship, but it is now totally discredited. Okay, so then what about this look-alike imposter idea? Uh, well, one professor, interestingly, actually did his doctoral dissertation trying to defend this hypothesis against the resurrection hypothesis. And this is actually going to be on belief map soon, but briefly, for several reasons, an imposter would not be able to trick the church persecutor Paul, nor could he trick James, the biological brother of Jesus, nor the Jesus' apostles. And there are eight more huge problems um, signifying the same exact conclusion. This is also discredi discredited. Okay, so what about the hallucination hypothesis? This, I don't know if you knew, this is the most popular naturalist explanation among historians today. This is also going to be on belief map soon, but in a nutshell, problems abound, and here are two. First, for several reasons, they would have known it was a hallucination. And second, hallucinations are like dreams. You can't share them and co-hallucinate. Carrier argues that they were simply congregating schizotypals, and schizotypals hallucinate more often. But it's easy to show the apostles weren't schizotypals. And in fact, Carrier's attempt just adds six more problems and the original problems remain. For example, schizotypals also never group hallucinate. I'm going to leave the illusion hypothesis and futuristic uh, alien technology hypothesis for Q&A. <laughs> but <laughs> with just two sources, I think we've got a really good starter case. Um, now, people do exist who think that any of these explanations is better than saying that God raised Jesus. And that's because nobody comes to this question in a vacuum. According to the CIA's World Factbook, 2% of people do believe that there is no God of any kind. In America, it's 3%. If you are entirely confident that no, Jesus, that, excuse me, that no God exists, then maybe group hallucination is more sensible for you. I don't think you're automatically irrational, but I, I would question where the confidence comes from. And that's why, if this is you, I would have loved to spend hours chatting about God's existence first. Um, it's where I do most of my reading. On this, I recommend uh, Belief Map again and the Oxford philosopher Richard Swinburne's book, Does God Exist? The Second Edition. Also, a striking number of lay atheists believe that there was never a historical Jesus either. Um, Matt himself is agnostic about it, so I would give a lecture on that too and, and why today there's not one teaching historian in the world at Cambridge, Harvard, Oxford, anywhere who doubts Jesus' existence. So I think God exists and Jesus is a real historical figure, but there's an important last question, which is, would God raise Jesus? I think the best explanation simply says, look around. Dead people stay dead. If there is a God, raising people from the dead obviously isn't his style. And so in response, I want to explain why Jesus is special and why God might uniquely choose to raise Jesus from death. I only have time to skim this, but I do want to address it. I think that the philosopher is obligated to ask, if becoming, God, if becoming incarnate and saving humanity and resurrecting is the kind of thing that God would do. So let me summarize what would be my first lecture. Right? If God exists, I would argue it's not improbable that God would create these very valuable things called moral agents with free will so they can love God freely. And if God creates moral agents with, with free will, it's not improbable that they would abuse it and, and do evil. And if this happens, it's not improbable that a holy and just God would need to find a way to answer past evil and ultimately all, eliminate all evil. Well, the only way for an agent to freely love God and yet never sin so that evil can be eliminated is to give that agent freedom. 
and then woo that agent into freely hating sin on his own so the agent can freely choose, God, you are good, and I'm not, and I want to submit my freedom back to you. Transform me. Take control. And that's philosophically the only way you can get and keep both, one, agents ha- who, excuse me, one, agents who have freely chosen to love God, and two, the elimination of all future evil. And finally, for these free agents, I think God would need to find a way to deal with their past sin. And I believe in doing this through Jesus, God has fulfilled his role as the greatest possible being. And I'm going to skip through a couple of these because I think time is short. Yeah, I'll just go back here. Yeah, I, I give a third lecture on, on foreshadowing Jesus through Israel's formation. Um, so let's quickly consider three formative events of Israel. These stories of which predate, no, I'm going to skip this too. I'm looking at, I'm at 30 minutes about, right, Ezra? Yeah, hold on, I got to skip past this. I apologize. Yeah, I'll go here. Basically, these are several lectures that would set up um, why I think God might raise Jesus. Um, Finally, uh, I'd give a fourth lecture on how Jesus stands today as the moral exemplar for humanity. Um, This image is uh, Jesus about to talk with a Samaritan woman. He asked her for a drink, and she said, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of of me, a woman of Samaria? So uh, that she was a woman was bad enough, but few readers realize how much Jews hated Samaritans. It, It was like a gang war. So when Jesus taught on the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself, and a Jew asked, who's my neighbor, how revolutionary is it for Jesus to tell of a good Samaritan? Jesus said, when a Roman forces you to carry his stuff for a mile and love, carry it for two miles. Jesus broke down barriers, not just with women, Samaritans, and Gentiles. He did it with the poor and the tax collectors and the most hated sinners of all. And against all conventions, Jesus was a king and rabbi who would say, Father, forgive them to his murderers while they're murdering him. He was a king who washed his disciples' feet. Contemporary Romans and Jews did not find this appealing. Neither one, I would argue, could be a natural source for this revolutionary ethic. It's almost like Jesus was out of this world, and he said he was. So I give a fourth lecture on how most specialists believe Jesus actually claimed to be either God or, like Bart Ehrman argues, at least a divine figure, claimed to be a divine figure who received worship and gave divine forgiveness. And I'd give a fifth lecture asking what sane rabbi with the moral fortitude of Jesus says that kind of thing about himself. Does such a malicious life fit with the character and sanity of Jesus? This is the man who Paul says appeared to him and transformed him, who the apostles went to their graves proclaiming, he appeared to us. I think that to avoid him tonight, you're going to hear an objection that either denies all contemporary scholarship on the issue or else endorses something like group hallucination. Thank you. And I'll, with that, I'll turn it over to Matt. Thank you very much. Tonight's second speaker is Matt Dillahunty. He is an American public speaker, avid gamer, magician, and internet personality, and was the president of the Atheist Community of Austin from 2006 to 2013. He has hosted the Austin-based webcast and cable access television show, The American Atheist Experience, in 2005, and formerly hosted the live internet radio show, Nonprofits Radio. A Southern Baptist for more than 25 years, not included in his bio, he was initially offended by our outreach name, Bible Beer Consortium. He sought to become a minister until his investigation of his religious views led him to reject supernatural claims. He now identifies as a skeptic, humanist, and atheist. He is a founder and contributor of the Counter Apologetics Encyclopedia Iron Chariots as well as the Atheist Debates Patreon Project, which are dedicated to providing the understanding and tools for more effective discussions between theists and atheists. He is regularly engaged in formal debates and travels the world speaking to secular organizations, churches, and university groups on religion, philosophy, skepticism, atheism, humanism, and magic. He's married to Beth Presswood, who is here tonight. Hello, Beth. a microbiologist and winner of the Austin Chronicles listener-selected best podcast, Godless Bitches, which always gets me in trouble. They live in Austin, Texas with their four cats, 
two snakes, and the occasional scorpion. Please welcome Matt Dillahunty. All right. I think we can add a. I think we can add a giant cockroach to the list, as there was one that just crawled off my laptop over to the mics. Uh, and by the way, I, Blake, I hope to hear those other lectures you talked about, and you might want to add one on why, if Fred is credible about A, B, and C, that we should also consider him credible about the extraordinary D claim that we can't confirm. I want to start by thanking Blake, who I genuinely enjoy talking to. For those who don't know, we've done a couple of debates already. We're looking forward to possibly doing some hangouts to discuss the fine points of where we disagree rather than these, these broader issues that are all kind of piled on top. And I want to thank the BBC and Ezra particularly, and also a special thank you to Micah, who's down there working the tech stuff and is going to be getting me the video and audio footage so I can get this out. I have a lot to get to, not quite as much as Blake. I, I probably won't have to skip as much, but here we go. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, writing for Sherlock Holmes, famously wrote, when you have eliminated all which is impossible, that whatever remains, but he said it better than I did, however improbable must be the truth. And he's correct, of course, but this poses a problem. How do you know that you've eliminated all other possibilities? If you're not very careful about defining your propositions and arguing in terms of direct negations, you are setting yourself up to be deceived. Doyle clearly thought that he was too smart to be fooled, and he was shown to be wrong repeatedly. He was a spiritualist, fascinated with mysticism and the occult. He believed in fairies, famously championing the Cottingley fairy pictures, which turned out to be cardboard cutouts of fairies stuck in a picture, and he thought that it was proof of the paranormal. He also believed that his friend Houdini could physically dematerialize, because when Houdini would escape, the ropes would still be in knots, and the shackles would still be firmly bound. Now, Houdini was dubious of the spiritualists and set out to debunk them, and he also tried to disabuse his friend Doyle of his belief in the paranormal. This ended up crippling their friendship. Houdini would perform a trick and flatly tell Doyle, it's just a trick, and Doyle refused to believe them. And Houdini's purpose in doing this was to show Doyle that he is quick to leap to supernatural explanations when he merely doesn't know what the actual explanation is. Doyle refused to believe him. Their friendship ended on not so good terms. Doyle's problem here is a version of the argument from personal incredulity fallacy, which was a mix of a failure of imagination, reaching conclusions with insufficient information, hubris, and a seemingly crippling fear of not knowing something or admitting that he didn't know something. Stop that. This problem, which for tonight, since we're renaming things, I will call Doyle's fallacy, just to make this simpler, is summed up in yet another quote from him. Any truth is better than indefinite doubt. And the skeptics in the room just cringed and died a little. <laughs> Josh McDowell, a Christian apologist and author of Evidence That Demands a Verdict, begins the portion of his book that deals with the resurrection with these words. After more than 700 hours of studying the subject, I have come to the conclusion that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is either one of the most wicked, vicious, heartless hoaxes ever foisted upon the minds of human beings, or it is the most remarkable fact of history. Josh, I think, has fallen victim to Doyle's fallacy. Perhaps 700 hours wasn't enough to consider other options. The idea that it's either an intentional hoax or amazingly true leaves out a whole host of other options. I've had believers demand that I prove that all the disciples were lying and intentionally creating a fiction, and if I can't do that, they won't give up their belief. They're not only committing Doyle's fallacy, they are hopelessly committed to it. So did Jesus rise from the dead? Is this an important question? Yeah, as Blake pointed out, this is probably, I'd say almost definitely, the most important question within Christianity. The earliest account appears in uh, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 15, and he begins by listing appearances that Jesus is reported to have made to people, ending with an appearance to Paul. But after stressing Paul's own insignificance, he goes on to claim why the issue is so important, as Blake already pointed out, and if Christ not be raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. He states a few other things in that chapter that we'll get back to in a little bit. So how would we go about determining if it's reasonable to believe that Jesus actually was raised from the dead? Well, you have to evaluate the claim. And if it's extraordinary, if it's in conflict with what we know about reality versus a mundane claim of his name was Joe or he had a dog, this affects the quantity and quality of evidence we should require before we can rationally accept the claim is probably correct. 
The more extraordinary the claim, the greater the evidence required. And this must all be done with an awareness that we may not have enough information to reach a reasonable conclusion. For example, if somebody come up to you and said one of the following three sentences, last night I saw something strange in the sky that appeared to be moving in ways that I can't explain given my current understanding of the potential explanations. All right, that person thinks too much on things the way I do, but they're not making a claim about what the explanation is, they're just telling you what they saw. Statement number two, last night I saw a spaceship from another solar system. Okay, uh, I'd, I'd like to know how you reached the conclusion about what it was, but and, and number three, last night I was abducted by aliens from another world. They looked like this, they acted like that. They opened my skull and resealed it in an undetectable fashion and implanted a device that's also undetectable. Those claims get gradually more specific and more extraordinary and less believable at face value, meaning they need increasingly more evidence to support them. The third one, in my view, is closer to the Christ resurrection story than the previous two. There's a hermit in India who claims that he has eaten no food and drank no water since 1940. He's been studied on at least two different occasions by scientists for periods of 10 to 15 days at a time. The reports from the scientists who investigated this remarkable claim confirm that his only contact with liquid during the period that they investigated him was when he gargled or bathed. They taped the toilet shut to make sure because he said he didn't poop either. So, turns out, 10 or 15 days later, yep, we didn't see him eat, we didn't see him drink, he definitely didn't use the bathroom. We don't know what to think about this. Now here's a living, breathing, well, I guess he, he's breathing. If he doesn't do the other things, maybe he doesn't breathe either, but here's a living, breathing human being claiming to be miraculously fed through a hole in the roof of his mouth by the Hindu god that he has served since the age of 11. He's been investigated by scientists. You can go investigate him yourself if you can find the cave that he's living in. He does live in a cave, I'm not just being facetious. Is he really being sustained by a god? I don't think so. Is he lying? Maybe, I, I might argue that he is probably more deceived than deceiver, but I don't have enough information to reach a conclusion. Are the scientific reports wrong? I suspect that they are. I suspect a combination of trickery, deception, improper test protocols, and a host of other things. This is why scientific rigor is so important. By the way, none of those scientific studies were submitted for peer review and there hasn't been really good testing done. But let's assume for a moment that he never did eat, drink, or poop. How is he able to do this? Is his claim that his God sustains him the most probable explanation for this? I'd argue that it isn't and that it can't be, and that even if we rule out all possibility of trickery, which I don't see how we can do, it's more probable that he's some sort of new biological entity or some oddity than that some Hindu god is sustaining him. Because the supernatural isn't something that we can demonstrate, and so we can't use it as a probable explanation until that demonstration has occurred. We have no way to confirm the existence of the supernatural or that it can interact with the natural world. And every time we hear somebody say, the cause must be supernatural, I have yet to see an example that wasn't because I can't think of any natural cause. That is a fallacy, period. You can't be justified in accepting a proposed explanation just because it's novel or because it feels right or because the, the source is trustworthy on other materials or because you can't think of anything better. So if someone were trying to make a case for the claim that Jesus did in fact rise from the dead as a miraculous resurrection from God, how can they argue it? Well, they might try a purely theological argument. I'm not interested in that. Those are faith-based doctrinal things and that wasn't necessarily what was presented here, so we'll just skip it. They might present a philosophical argument, but there's a problem there as well because any philosophical argument for a miraculous resurrection must contain some premise that acknowledges or presupposes the existence of the supernatural when William Lane Craig has debated the resurrection in the past, he begins by saying that he presupposes the existence of a God, specifically a God that is capable of and desirous of resurrecting somebody. I can think of no bigger or more unfounded and well-poisoning assumption than to begin with the assumption of the very God we're talking about. It's not just a matter of assuming the supernatural here. It's about assuming the precisely tuned version of the supernatural that would lead to the very resurrection you're trying to demonstrate, making it a thinly veiled circular argument. You could perhaps try a scientific argument, but we're stuck. I don't see how that's possible. I don't even see any attempts at this really. 
there's simply no physical evidence to examine. There's no way to replicate the scenario. There's just no room for a proper scientific investigation. And science is, and this isn't a fault of science, it's a recognition of its own limitations, prohibited from confirming the supernatural until there's a mechanism to do so. And that leaves us with historic arguments. This is the most common modern defense, and it's the one that I expect we'll hear tonight. Hey, look, I wrote that. The problem here is that history can't confirm the supernatural for the same reasons that science can't. Additionally, the most common apologetic method tries to present a set of minimal facts and demand an explanation for them as if this, am I out of time? As if this were a good method. When in reality, it's merely disguising the unreliability of the sources that those minimal facts are derived from and absolutely fails to understand that we don't look for an explanation for minimal facts, we look for explanations for maximal facts. And it fails to notice that we don't require a single explanation for a set of facts necessarily because it may be the case that the set of facts has a set of explanations. Three people report that they've seen the same ghost. What's the explanation? Maybe there are three. Maybe one of them was having a hallucination, a grief-induced hallucination. One of them was on drugs. And the other one's lying and just agreeing with the other two because they saw it. He wants to be cool and go along with the rest of the pack. That last note um, really is about reality not being tidy. And while it's, it's good for us to look for elegant solutions that explain a great deal, that doesn't mean that an elegant solution that explains a great deal exists and is the accurate model. Let's consider the methods of historians for a moment. When scientists want to look back at the future, uh, back at the future, hey, I've seen that movie. Back to the past, they have to rely on whatever physical remnants are left behind. The geologic column, ice cores, artifacts, both biological and non-biological, in nature and in origin. We don't have a time machine, so the scientific process relies on whatever physical evidence they can find. Historians, on the other hand, operate in a more literary realm. Looking for written accounts and trying to make their best guess at what most probably happened. There's a bit of an art to it making it a fuzzy science-like field of study, but limited in its reliability. They also make some basic assumptions. If someone is generally portrayed as a real person and the available texts portray them this way and not as a fictional being, then historians just assume that this person was real. This is one of the reasons that the Jesus' historicity issue uh, isn't doubted by most historians, even though there may be good reason to doubt it. Um, I will admit that mythicist positions are often fringe and I've used the words batshit crazy on some occasions. But that doesn't mean that there's not perhaps good reasons to doubt both the historical method of assuming that somebody existed and how strongly we can consider this claim to be reliable. But I'm not arguing for Jesus' non-existence tonight. So what do historians consider to be the best possible sources? First, accounts from contemporaries, accounts from people living at the time of the recorded events. Second, first-hand accounts. Despite knowing the flaws of eyewitness testimony, it remains about the best that we can get from historical sources, so we go with them. Accounts from unbiased sources. Historians with a record of accuracy and impartiality are preferred. And accounts where multiple sources agree on facts, the more sources, the better. If you want to have a solid historical grounding for facts about a battle, it'd be ideal to have a report from military leaders from both sides of the conflict who agree on who won and how many were killed. It'd be nice if you had several such accounts because reports from only one side of any dispute should be considered dubious. In the early formation of Christianity, there were disagreements over nearly every point of doctrine, including the resurrection, and those who won the doctrine disputes had their views proclaimed as orthodox and their books canonized, while those who lost have their doctrines viewed as heretical, and there seems to be no way to tell which of them, if any, are actually correct. But no matter what the claims are, historians don't get to look at a collection of facts and conclude that a miracle is the best probable, most probable explanation for those facts. Historian Bart Ehrman has pointed out that by definition, a miracle is the least probable explanation for a set of facts, and historians could never opt for the least probable explanation when they're looking for the most probable one. Nor will I add, should they resist listing it as unexplained until some probable explanation is presented. There can simply be no historical confirmation of the resurrection. There can be historical reliable information about the claims about a resurrection or what people say that they saw, but the actual resurrection is not something that can be confirmed historically. 
They don't get to begin with an assumption of Jesus. You don't get to begin with an assumption of God. You don't get to end with a conclusion of a miracle through historical methods. And when you begin with assumptions, your conclusion can be no more reliable than the assumptions were. Now, not knowing exactly what Blake would argue for, I wanted to consider the biblical claims that we may need to evaluate in order to reach a conclusion. And first, I wanted to look to see if it met the criteria of good historical references. Are these accounts from contemporaries? No. Are they first-hand accounts? No. Well, you might consider Paul a first-hand account, except that Paul had a vision. He doesn't have an experience with the resurrection itself. He has a vision later on. So we'll give him a half point for possible first-hand account. Are they from unbiased sources? No. These are people who are writing specifically to try to convince people of what they believe. We don't have you know, sources that contradict these. Are the accounts from multiple sources in agreement? No. Not even the accounts in the Bible agree on the relevant facts, which is why the minimal facts approach had to be invented in the first place so that apologists could say, well, I know that there's a lot of little confusion and this might disagree with that. Let's just go with empty tomb, people believed, and Christianity exploded. Well, okay, but we have a story in the Gospels. Four anonymous rooks, books written 35 to 90 years after the events in a time where the average life expectancy was 45, degree, 45 years, not degrees. It's just hot up here. The church, as a matter of tradition, labeled these Gospels Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those almost certainly weren't written by eyewitnesses or disciples or the individuals whose names appear on them. Those individuals writing these stories definitely weren't unbiased. They were trying to convince people that their beliefs were true. So when did Jesus die? Did a bunch of zombies march on Jerusalem? What were his last words? Did he carry his own cross? It depends on which gospel you're reading. Who went to the tomb? Was the stone already rolled away? What was in the tomb? Did they tell anybody what they saw? It depends on which gospel you're reading. The gospel accounts aren't contemporary accounts. They aren't first-hand accounts, and they aren't from unbiased sources, and they don't agree from, with the facts. They simply aren't good historical sources, and we don't really have any better sources. The first account comes from Paul, as I said, in 1 Corinthians, which was written about two decades after the events. It's not contemporary. It's a first-hand account of a vision, but not the resurrection, and it's hardly unbiased. But let's take a look at what he wrote, because I find it very interesting. Starting at verse 12, he says, but if it is preached that Christ has not been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there's no resurrection in the dead, or of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ hasn't been raised, our preaching to you is useless, and, your, and so is your faith. More than that, we have been found to be false witnesses about God, for we've testified that God has raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ hasn't been raised. And if Christ hasn't been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. And those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. This, in my estimation, is a very damning passage because Paul is basically arguing, hey, we've told you Christ rose. How can you possibly say the dead don't rise? That fallacious argument from authority is kind of the how dare you question me poisoning of the well to begin this passage. If the dead don't come back to life, then Christ hasn't come back to life. Okay, I'll buy that. Are we done now? Because we're in agreement the dead don't come back to life. But we don't have any good evidence to think that people are rising from the dead. If Christ isn't raised, we're wasting our time. That's an admission of an incentive to believe, but I'll go with it. Moreover, if he hasn't raised, then those of us who claim it are lying. This is the are you calling me a liar defense, which is an emotional appeal designed to get people who don't want to say that you're lying and don't want to adopt a burden of proof that you are intentionally trying to deceive them to just go, no, I'm not saying you're lying. The options aren't lying or truth. There could also be you're wrong, you're mistaken. You haven't got your facts straight. And he ends with the if Christ, if Christ doesn't rise, if the dead don't rise, then everybody who's died is lost. This is an emotional appeal. Don't you want to live forever? Don't you want to see your loved ones again? You really need to believe that the dead can raise. Otherwise, life is all there is. Well, maybe life is all there is. This whole passage is just a big claim. Jesus has been resurrected, surrounded by a parade of fallacious appeals to authority, consequences, and emotion. And when you look at the accounts in the order they were written, instead of the order they appear in the Bible, there's all the hallmarks of legend building. Paul's account just said Christ wrote, died and rose and appeared to people, including 500 unnamed people, some of whom were supposedly still alive, but he didn't give names so anybody could go check. Paul's account doesn't mention you know, empty tombs and all the other details. It's very simple. Jesus lived, died for us, resurrected, boom, done. 
appeared to some people, appeared to me in a vision, and now I'm telling you about it. That's Paul's entire story. Mark's account written next, and by next we mean somewhere between five and 30 years after Paul's. He has two Marys going to an, anoint Jesus' body and wondering how they're gonna get into the tomb, which is poor planning on their part, I guess. Luckily, the stone is already moved out of the way, and there's a young man inside wearing white who tells him Jesus is risen, and that they should go tell the disciples and Peter. But the women are afraid and they don't tell anybody, which has to make you wonder how we know about this story. But the story ended there until much later, somebody decided they didn't like the way that Mark ended at verse eight, and they added verses nine through 20. Now, in verse eight, we left with no sign of Jesus and the women not telling anybody. So what, what should we do in verse nine? Why, let's just reverse both of those facts. In verse nine, Jesus shows up and talks to Mary. And in verse 10, she runs off to tell all the disciples. These are the two verses that follow, no Jesus, Mary's not telling anybody. Boom, these two verses. Now this is curious because she goes and tells the disciples, but they don't believe her. So Jesus appeared in a different form, whatever that means, to two of them, and they go and tell the rest of the disciples, but the disciples don't believe him. Then Jesus interrupts a dinner with all 11 disciples and rebukes them for not believing. Now this is very curious. It's almost as if the author realized that he was setting up a chain that would have led to, and then the disciples told the world, but the world didn't believe, so Jesus appeared to the world. Oh, no, no, we can't have that. So let's end with a rebuking of their lack of faith so that we don't end up with that response. Tough, you're getting it anyway. So then the author of the new ending to Mark decides to up the ante by having Jesus talk about his, how his true followers will be able to drink poison without being harmed and handle venomous snakes uh, without being harmed and heal the sick. That's not just an aside that I'm using to poke fun at an obvious forgery. If we're gonna look at the author, or in this case authors of the gospels and claim that they're reliable, then all of what they said has to be taken into consideration with regard to their credibility. So after Mark, we get to Matthew, written up to 40 years after Mark, maybe. And the story has now grown. Now there's two Marys going to the tomb. This time the stone is still there and there's an earthquake and an angel appears like lightning and he's dressed in white, kind of like the young man in the tomb who doesn't make an appearance in this version. The angel rolls back the tomb and sits on it and this terrifies the guards. Wait, guards? There weren't any guards in the other version. These guards became like dead men. They shook and became like dead. And the angel tells the women that Jesus is gone and they should go tell everybody and they run off and they tell everybody, the disciples at least. On the way, Jesus appears to them. I guess he couldn't be bothered to show up at the tomb to get the message right in the first place. And he says, hang on, just tell the disciples to meet me in Galilee. Because uh, I guess he can't make a pit stop there where they're going. In Matthew's versions, those guards run off to tell the priest what's happened. And the priests bribe the guards to tell people that the disciples stole the body in the night. And the author of Matthew points out, and this story is still circulating today. So what we have here is decades after the events in question, when some folks have been claiming that perhaps the disciples stole the body, a gospel is written that claims that there were guards who were bribed to start that dastardly lie. So do we believe the story that was circulating before the gospel? Or do we believe the gospel, which may have been written specifically to discredit that other story? I don't know. Luke's gospel is next. It's written between one and 50 years after Matthew's gospel. It has uh, some women going to the tomb with spices. When they get there, the stone is already rolled away. Hey, we're back to that scenario. They go in the tomb, it's empty, no angels, no young man in white. Instead, two men follow them into the tomb. And these two men have clothes that gleam like lightning. So we've got lightning back as if the word was important enough to stick with the narrative, but not the facts about the lightning. It's almost as if this didn't happen. The men scold the women for coming to the tomb and they should have remembered that Jesus was gonna rise. And of course, as soon as they're reminded of this, then they remember. They run off to tell the disciples, but they don't believe the women because their words were like nonsense. Peter then runs off to the tomb and finds the linen strips. He's the chief investigator in Luke and um, wonders what's happened. Meanwhile, Jesus appears to two of them on a road, but apparently he's in disguise because those two don't uh, recognize him, um, or he's hiding himself, or they're just stupid. 
Then they ask him to stay for dinner, and during dinner he breaks bread with them, and then all of a sudden they recognize him. Cool. This is followed by an appearance to uh, the others when those two are t telling the story, which kind of makes the appearance to those two irrelevant, because if you're just going to meet up with them when they gather the rest of the disciples to, to show yourself, why not do it then, and why disguise yourself? What a prankster God. In John, probably the latest gospel, it must have been written, or it may have been written a decade before or after Luke, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb, presumably alone, as nobody else has mentioned. The stone is already moved away from the entrance. She runs, into, she runs to tell Peter and another disciple that Jesus' body has been stolen. These two take off running, but Peter is the slow one, and the other disciple gets there first. Weird that Luke had Peter get there as the first investigator, but John has Peter a little more like me. I'm not going to run very fast. So the other guy gets there first. The other disciple investigates the linen straps that Peter investigated in Luke's gospel, and then Peter comes in and investigates, and then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also goes in and investigates. So he's like a time-traveling disciple. He gets in and gets out. Maybe it's a grammatical error. I don't know. Strangely, some people will point to the grammatical errors like that and say, this is evidence for why this has to be true, because if people were making it up, they wouldn't make obvious mistakes like that. That sort of apologetic is on a par with the conspiracy theorists who say, but that's the precise denial you would give me if you really were a member of the Illuminati. That's the way that thinking works. And while the tortoise and time traveling hare disciples are racing back to tell the others, Mary is outside crying, looks in the tomb, sees two angels in white. Evidently, they couldn't be bothered to be there when our disciple heroes were. And they ask her why she's crying. She tells them Jesus has been stolen. Jesus turns out to be right behind her, but she doesn't recognize him at first. And then he says her name and she recognizes him and then he appears to the disciples, but Thomas isn't there, so he has to do it again. And then he has to let Thomas, you know, press the holes in his hand and stick his hands in his side and all this stuff because we need a token skeptic at this point. We need someone who when people start raising doubts about this, we can say, ah, Thomas was skeptical and he believes now because he tested it for himself and so you should too. Well, I know Joe Nickel, who's a, a skeptical investigator for CFI, and I value his opinion. And if Joe came and told me that he had stuck his fingers in the holes of the resin, risen Jesus, I wouldn't believe him. And Joe's a good enough skeptic that he wouldn't have expected me to believe, and neither should the gospel authors. So it's a mess. This thing with Thomas shows that we've got a physical body that's necessary for the story that we're building. But we've seen that in each installment of the version of, of, the, of the story, as time goes by, the details get grander and more specific and more confused because you have different authors. Apologists want to tell us to ignore all of this disagreement, all the exaggeration and, and, and legend building, and instead just focus on simple facts like the empty tomb and the belief in the followers and how rapidly it spread. But those are all based on the disastrously incredible accounts in the Gospels and in Acts. And they simply can't be reconciled, let alone considered believable. The other problem with this is, even if we said, okay, if we went with this, like, here's a set of minimal facts and we found these believable, what happens next? That becomes the bait to get people to accept these less credulous accounts. And that's why there is a massive, massive amount of Christian believers who, have no, who think that the Gospels were literally written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, like immediately after the events. The church doesn't seem to do a very, the churches, I don't want to just go with the Roman Catholic Church or whatever, don't seem to do a good job of educating people about the truth of the scriptures that they're reading from. Now, David Hume suggested we consider whether it's more likely that the individual relaying the story of a resurrection is deceived or attempting to deceive than that he was truly raised from the dead and to reject the greater miracle. Hume doesn't say accept the lesser miracle because Hume understood this stuff. He also suggests that we proportion our belief to the evidence, that our, our confidence level in something should be proportional to the evidence for it. And he also asked, why don't things like this happen now? Why is it that the rate and scope of miraculous accounts diminishes as our ability to investigate them properly increases? Now, C.S. Lewis is a popular reference in Christendom, but he also fell prey to the Doyle fallacy. But where Doyle would merely prefer any explanation to doubt, and Josh McDowell narrows it down to either truth or deliberate hoax, 
Lewis famously added a third option, Lord, liar, or lunatic. But like Doyle and McDowell, he missed other options. He even missed another option that begins with an L, legend. Now there may be other options. I'm not saying I have hit the fourth and final option, so I don't think in those terms. But I have found a fourth option. And I think the evidence best supports legend. So when we're asked if Jesus was raised from the dead and what we can reasonably believe about this, we have three options. Yes, no, or I don't know. And I don't know is an important one because the onus is on a definite yes. This is the most important fact of what would be the most important religion were it to be true. There should be no question. This debate should be impossible. This should be the most confirmed and easily confirmable point in history ever. And it is not. If you have incredibly rigorous standards of evidence, you might be obliged to go with, I don't know. I definitely lean that direction. I would certainly never claim with certainty that none of this happened. I just don't have good reason to believe it. But given what we know about humanity's propensity for inventing and, and crafting legends and exaggerating and how we're likely to say things on behalf of beliefs that we sincerely hold but are sincerely wrong as Christians would think of every other adherent to every other religion who have their miracle stories and their God beliefs, you might still be able to go with, no, it's probably a legend because you're not claiming certainty and I'm not claiming certainty. I think it's probably a legend. So when people ask me, you know, hey, the disciples, these pe they, they claim that they had these experiences. Well, first of all, I can't interview them. I can't investigate them. I don't know. I will agree to you. That story appears in the books. There is a claim that they had experiences. The next question is, did they really believe it? I don't know. I can't rule out the possibility of deception. I can't rule out the possibility of uh, attempts to honestly lie for something that you believe to be ultimately good, which some early church fathers were accused of, but we don't have time to get into that. I can't say that they're lying. What I can say is they might have honestly believed and thought they had good reasons and have been wrong. But there's another possibility, or at least I can't show that it's not possible, so far as we can tell, nobody dead's ever raised. I mean, yes, we resuscitate people and stuff, but pretty much if you're heart dead, brain dead for three days in a, in a, you know, in a Jerusalem tomb, you're dead. Uh, there's probably no coming back from that. However, if it happened, what does that tell us? It doesn't tell us anything at all about how or why it happened. You can't then immediately conclude that the reason this happened, if it had happened, is because Jesus was God and God raised him. You, are, you have to make a case for that as well. You have to make a demonstration of this causal connection because until then at most you have a mystery. You have this incredible event that you can't explain. Unfortunately for Christianity, we don't even have that event. We have stories with no supporting evidence. So the only way that I see that someone could say yes he was most probably miraculously resurrected from the dead is if they're willing to ignore flawed human thought, willing to ignore the problems of trying to establish the probability of events for which you can't begin to investigate them, willing to ignore our propensity for exaggeration and dishonesty and storytelling and our inability to confirm supernatural causation and then take an unwarranted leap of faith. Only then can you answer yes. Now, I can't do that. And while I know otherwise reasonable people do this, I don't see how they can do that and say that it is in fact reasonable. I also don't know how a God could expect people to believe this most important point on such a disastrous mess of hearsay. And so my answer is, I'm not sure, but I suspect the story is a legend and that Jesus did not rise from the dead. Thanks. Matt Dillahunty.
We will now transition to cross-examination. All right. Once again, cross-examination will be 15 minutes each. We will start, Mr. Dillahunty. I will remind them only at 10, 5, and 2 minutes. Matt, please begin. All right. so, um, so as to not seem unfair, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask you the question that I asked while I was setting up my laptop, and that's this. Let's say that I agree that Fred, who I, I should have used Fred when I was talking about Luke and Axe, but I didn't. Um, let's say that I agreed that Fred was reliable on trade winds and islands within 90 miles and a number of other factors about the historic world. Isn't that something I would just expect from anybody living in that time who was a historian who was writing? And why then should I consider him as a reliable source for more extraordinary claims that we can't verify? So regarding that first question, uh, that's where the Slarkin uh, quote uh, is gonna be relevant because they note that there were no contemporary reference works that would allow you to pull out these details for one. And this thing on the island, remember, uh, the Cauda, which is located uh, right 90 miles off of Crete, that was something that historians couldn't locate in general. So there would have been no, no way for someone to just research and get the information. That was, the, that was supposed to be the value. So nobody had ever been there and come back and reported that there's an island 90 miles off? No, no, they know, they know that there's a mile that's okay, far so away. it's possible. Hold on, they know the mile's far away. But it's, uh, for the ancients, they had the longitude problem. And what this meant was, is it was for that far distance, it was nearly impossible for them to estimate where the island was located. Sure. And but well, hold on, let me finish. And just to finish. And so it, the two uh, reports that we had on the location of this island at this time were from Pliny and Ptolemy. And my point was that if... Uh, you had gone by either of those contemporary reports, it actually would have falsified Fred's, Luke's account, you know, whatever you want to call him, his, his account. And so that's why uh, uh, Hemer came back and said, look, it's uh, increasingly more obvious that uh, he did not get his information from some other source. And okay, but I, I don't necessarily need to posit that. So first of all, if somebody came back and had a similar story, mm -hmm. um, these sorts of things could have been passed around it, but it's also possible that he was telling the truth, that, hey, they hit with this trade when we ended up over here. Um, there was another point in, in your, your talk which relates to this, where you mentioned, for example, 45,000 historical sources. Now, that's a cool big number. It's not historical sources. It's like citations, peer-reviewed journals, and they, which themselves are citing peer-reviewed journals, which that, it's a whole network of scholarship. Okay, I might have confused two points because I thought at some point there were... 45,000 historical documents that were referenced. But anyway, that's a huge number, and you threw out some awesome numbers. Of those 45,000, do any of them contain contemporary, firsthand, unbiased accounts of the actual resurrection? A contemporary, unbiased accounts of the resurrection. First off, that's not even, oh, actually, I'm not going to dodge your question. I don't think so, based on those criteria. Right. But a more important question is, uh, why do you need that? Uh, I, I understand you because said that those these are the best sources, right? But this is—it would be a fallacy to say that just because you don't have the best sources doesn't mean your sources aren't good enough. Oh no, no, no! That's not a fallacy. It is entirely possible for you to say these sources aren't good enough because they're not the best sources. What we can't say is that the story, we could not say that because we don't have good sources, the story is false. We couldn't do that. That would be a fallacy. But I'm entirely within the realm of my rights, and so is anyone else with regard to reason, to say these are not the most reliable sources, and the sources that we have are not reliable enough to establish this as a reliable fact. So th those are two different claims. And just to make sure I'm understanding you, when you say, when we say we don't have the best sources, you are kind of going through Airman's list here. You know, with the contemporaries, there are people who with no bias, there, which well, by the way, hardly, Airman's list. Wh which hardly, you know, so um, just, so I guess the first point is, if you go through this list, you're gonna have to chuck 99% of history. Because for 99% of history, you don't have th this list, the best conceivable sources. Sure. All that historians care about is that your information is good enough. 
So let, you can have someone that hits three of the list rather than the four, and according to you, you'd have to chuck it because it's not our best source. No, I, w I was asking if any of the 45,000 qualify as any of those. Was, because of the 45,000, how many of those sources have anything specifically to do with the resurrection of Jesus at all? Because a lot of those sources are going to be, um, you know, historical about events of the time and all the other neat history stuff you cited. Of those 45,000 historical sources, how many of them apply to the facts of the resurrection specifically? And, and just to, to go back to your question, like, who reports the resurrection? I mean, that's not something that you... I would think if it happened, everybody. Well, no, no. No, that's not true. I mean, it would be whoever... It, you mean whoever he appears to. Sure, anybody uh, anybody if, who was a witness to the re if, resurrection if some, would have been telling him. Okay, right. But just to clarify, if someone just said... Um, Jesus rose from the dead, and that was their report, that would be of no value whatsoever. Correct. What matters, and what I built my argument on, was that we can very confidently get back to the of Jerusalem apostles proclaiming that we saw Jesus. It's not a proclamation that Jesus rose, although they did say that. The relevant proclamation is that he, we had this experience. We saw him, and that's... And the relevant proclamation is that there's a claim that they had an experience. But you just acknowledged that saying God rose from the dead, Jesus rose from the dead, would have been of no value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if it, they just simply, okay. if they just... Do we have if anything it, that is more, uh, if, if, if claiming Jesus rose from the dead of no value is of no value, claiming Jesus appeared to me should be of no value as well. So, um, it, I think I did say that claiming Jesus rose is of no value. That's mistaken. There is an argument for Jesus' resurrection based on the um, okay. interestingness of that the that these Jews would claim that Jesus rose. So I have to take that back, okay. which, you know, you didn't need it well, anyways. That, that will blow away the whole line of question they were going to But, but I'm, not, I'm not making that argument tonight, so sure. don't worry about it. Sure. Uh, can you, sorry, can you repeat that second part, though? It doesn't matter. If you've already retracted this idea that it, it's of no value to say God rose, uh, Jesus rose from the dead, then the rest of the, the question is moot. You're right. So, so the, the, go ahead. So... For the various miraculous accounts from other religions and folklore, mm -hmm. what would it take to convince you that those were true? I think what I'd want to see is an account of something that I can't have an easy naturalistic explanation for. So, if you, so are you saying that if you don't have an easy naturalistic explanation, you're justified or willing to just jump to supernatural explanation? No, it's more complex than that. There's a, I mean, you know I'm a Bayesian about this, so it's gonna take into account things like, like prior probability. Yeah, but what what's I, the prior hold on. probability of the supernatural? Hold on, what I would say is that this, uh, if, that it would count as evidence for, you know, even something supernatural happening, if that's what, if, if we were pointing to some supernatural event. Um, I, and, it's, and it's evidence because we could argue that it fits more, it fits better on the hypothesis of, of the supernatural hypothesis than on the natural hypothesis. So, so it, there would be evidence, but that doesn't get you the conclusion. It could still be false. Sure. So you, you have things like Luke Acts. Mm -hmm. Fred. We love Fred. And basically, Fred is reliable on A, B, and C, so we should consider him reliable on D, is the core of what you were saying. That was one part of the it argument. Was, it was at least, okay, right, he's it was substantial, mm -hmm. because if all we have is Fred, which is all you went off of. You, you said you didn't need to go to the gospel. first. The first Corinthians 15 creed sure. and the Acts 2 speech. One week, remember, we didn't even need the Fred stuff to get the reliability of the Acts 2 speech because the Acts 2 speech we can trace to Jerusalem just right. based on these Semitic features but and whatnot. But hold on, wait, wait, real quick. Hang on. This Re is about the reliability of the speech. I don't care about the reliability of the speech. I care about the reliability of the facts that the speech is claiming. That's the question. This isn't, the, the subject of the debate is not, was it claimed reliably, or was it claimed by people that Jesus rose from the dead? Did people sincerely believe that, re, th those aren't the point of the debate. And so I don't, I don't think that, you know, citing that we have good reason to believe that people thought that they had these experiences is relevant. I because I'm willing to say that, yeah, you have good reason to believe that people believed this and that they claimed this because here's the book. Okay, excellent. So you, you will, you do agree with Again, all non-Christian scholars that the apostles did have this experience that they thought was Jesus appearing no, to them. You, no, you're, 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 you've, you've kind of misconstrued the point. Okay. I will agree that these are, this is what has been reported. I don't think that the stories are accurate. I view the stories as legend. And so it would be along the lines of saying, uh, do, do you agree that there's a story uh, of a search for the Holy Grail? Yes, I agree that that story is there. But I don't agree that there's a grail or that the events of the story actually happened. Can, 
when you start saying when uh, this is reported, let's fill in the blank because I want to know when you talk about what you what you want to report of. Are you talking about the report that the apostles had this experience, or are you talking about the report that Jesus appeared to them, or what's the report that you're looking for? I need a report. Well, I don't, I don't need a, a report alone is not going to be sufficient. I need evidence that an actual appearance of Jesus occurred, and that it wasn't a grief hallucination, that it wasn't just a mistake, that it wasn't a lie, that it wasn't a story that somebody added on to as we added at the end of Mark. The reason I ask is I, I feel like you're avoiding the argument that I set up, which was step one, that the apostles had this genuine experience that they, are, that they really were claiming. Yes, that I don't Jesus believe that they had that experience. Okay so, just to, okay, so just to be very clear, you are in contradiction with, with Bart Ehrman, with every non-Christian scholar out there in saying that the apostles actually didn't have this experience, or, no, or, or no, you lack the evidence for it. You're I, not convinced. I am not convinced that, the, that they had the experiences. I'm happy to be, I'm okay. happy to accept that these experiences have been relayed. Uh -huh. Okay. But uh, it's still my question time, so I want to get to a couple of things. There's a bunch of these I'm going to have to skip over. Um, so we have a number of accounts that are in the Bible of Jesus' appearance. Paul outlines the list of them. Um, portions of that list appear elsewhere. What about non-biblical sources like the Gospel of the Hebrews where Jesus appeals, appears to James, his brother, and converts him? Should we believe that? The Gospel of Hebrews? I mean, if any source that you put forward, I, you know, I'd take it on an individual basis. Okay. And no, the Gospel of Hebrews isn't something that I see any reason to trust in. Okay. Well, this is the foundation for where, the, where they got this thing of James, Jesus' brother. Um, so Wait, sorry, what? J that Jesus appeared to James, his brother. No, no, that, that's in 1 Corinthians 15 itself. And, w yeah, we've got... No, that's that. Paul talking to him. But, well, well, all right, we'll get back to that. Um, what about the Mormon account of Jesus appearing to the early Americans? Should we believe that? So what's, what's the case? Let's hear the case. Well, it's in the Book of Mormon. So that, that's not... I mean, so obviously there's lots of books I mean, that say G things. Jesus showed up and appeared to the early people in America. Right. Should we, should we believe that? I, I'd need to see the evidence for it. Okay, well, the, the evidence, I would say, is that these people claimed that they had this, or actually Joseph Smith claimed that these people had this experience and wrote it down, mm -hmm. and it became a thriving religion. So have you ruled out lying? No. Have you ruled out, I mean, hallucination? Have you ruled out, I mean, no. I, I just don't, I just see too many easy ways to give, look, okay. here's, there are so many easy naturalistic explanations that this just isn't going to be evidence for me. Okay, so... How is this not just a case of bias toward the canonized versions and a discrediting of the non-canonized versions? I'm trying to use criteria that are granted and worked with by every university on the planet. And, and according to these criteria, I've built a case. Um, it's a very deep case, so I, I can't present it all in a quick Q&A, sure. but there are, they have reasons for what they're, for what they're saying and doing. Um, you don't have that for the Book of Mormon and for that case. It's entirely different. We don't? Yeah, what's, I, I'd love to hear it. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not here to defend the Book of Mormon in case anybody was confused <laughs> about that. Uh, I find it to be one of the most obviously manufactured religions out there, but part of that's because it's so new. Uh -huh. And I think that we would be saying the same thing about other religions, including Christianity, uh, where we a little further back in time. So. Let's try for a non-supernatural claim. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of people who will tell you they've been abducted by aliens. Do you believe them? I'd have to, I, I haven't found an account that I believe yet, but I haven't been reading them either. Sure. But you're aware that there are people who claim this. Uh -huh. Are they lying? I, I, I mean, do we, do I, we think it's likely they're lying? I'd have to look, and I doubt I, all of them are lying. I agree, you'd have to look. Great. How would you look at the account of, let's say, the, the Franks, who are dead now. All we have is what they wrote down about their account. How could you possibly investigate that? I mean, that's a complex question because I, I just, I, 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 I would look to go see, hey, what information do we have on what they claim? What, what's around? I mean, sure. history is kind of a dirty process. You just got to get creative and do what you can to, to get what information you can. So I, I don't have like a clean answer of what you would do. Uh, well, I, I, think, I, I think that the reason you don't have a clean answer for what you would do is that because you can't actually interview these people, all you have to go on is what they said. 
I mean, that's all we can go on is what Barney and Betty Frank said about being abducted by aliens. Well, I mean, you can also look at things like their motive and their psychological condition, which historians how, how can look at. How are you going to look at, at that can, when all you have is what they said? What I'm saying is historians can work to get more information that builds into the puzzle in the picture, and you put all that together to come to a conclusion. Do you think we could get to their motivations, this couple from the 50s? I think, I mean, you want to be careful about psychoanalyzing historical figures, sure. but yeah, I think, I think you can know quite a bit about motivations, and you know, okay. I mean, we say things I'm about motivations. I'm not convinced that we have enough information from a, a, a trivial couple in the 50s to be able to psychoanalyze them, but I'm extremely more doubtful that we have the ability to investigate claims that are thousands of years old, where all we have are scraps of paper with, this is what we were told to happen. I mean, these are accounts of accounts of accounts of accounts. Th this is kind of like, I mean, earlier in the speech, I talked about how we have, um, you know, we've reconstructed the, tra the travel itinerary of these ships that were sailing during Claudius's reign to ship grain. And I was like, look, the historians are amazing. What and do the it, ships it, have to do with resurrection? Just so you know, just hold on. But I mean, this is like you coming back and just saying, there's no way historians could know that. And, no, and this is like saying, we know that when Barney and Betty Franks were out there on this night, there was a trucker on this road. At least that relates to their story. But telling me about trucking, shipping trucks in the vicinity of their claim that aren't specific to their claim is irrelevant. If, if, the, his, if the evidence is so bad, then why are all scholars convinced? All scholars are convinced that Jesus rose from the dead? Every teaching scholar is convinced that, that, that the apostles had an appearance, exper had this experience that they thought was Jesus appearing to them. That's what, that's what my whole case was built on. Sure. Okay. And you, and you denied it. No, you said I'm not convinced that they're correct because there are problems with the historical process, which I pointed out in my talk. All right. Let's transition. Blake, 15 minutes beginning now. I'm just going to keep pressing sure, on, yeah. on to that because it, it really is my needed to be that rigid. <laughs> it, really, it really is my uh, entire case. Um, I, I guess I mean part of what I if, if we you and I had more time together, I'd really want to see if I could build up your confidence in, in historians and what they do. And, and I don't think it's a coincidence that they all agree that the apostles had these real experiences. Uh, I mean, when you, work, when you look in historical Jesus studies and New Testament studies, these guys disagree all over the place. I mean, there's they're such a wide spectrum. And so when you get these rare instances that they all converge and are absolutely confident on something, like all the quotes that I read, um, isn't it rational at that point to give them benefit of the doubt? Oh, see, that's what the historians are doing. So this whole thing of benefit of the doubt is the bulk of the historic To method. give the historians benefit of the doubt. No, I'm not giving the historians benefit of the doubt. I'm pointing out that their methods are flawed. They're, they are giving benefit of the doubt, and it happens for a number of reasons. Number one, if somebody's presented as real, we just assume they're real. There's no point in beginning with, you know, oh, they're a fiction until proven otherwise. The burden of proof should be on demonstrating they're fictional, and we need to do that in the context of the way it's written. And when somebody says, writes down, I have this amazing experience, when historians, say, when historians look at that, they don't say they definitely had this experience. What they say is, we are convinced that this person is accurately representing the experience that they believe they had. And those are different. That's not what the historians say. If historians are saying this person actually had this experience, and not just this person sincerely believed they had this experience, then historians are even more flawed than any of us could have projected. OK, so I just want to be very clear, because this is everything as far as I'm concerned tonight. You cannot say that somebody actually had this experience. So you are discrediting Oxford, Princeton, Yale. If those Yale, are the people who are saying this, absolutely. Harvard, every, every, every university and yes. every scholar. OK, if, if, you're, you're like, there's no way they could do that. I don't believe your claim. There's no way they could know. There isn't. How could you know that someone actually had this private experience? Matt, Matt, so you're telling me that because you don't know how they know, that therefore they don't, that therefore they're, they just couldn't possibly know. No, I'm asking you. And it's a grand I, coincidence I'm, I'm, that they all agree. No, they all agree because they have bought into methods of history that give history, history that give the benefit of the doubt that if somebody says, I had this experience, and we don't have reason to disbelieve it, we just take them at their word. That's not what they do. It is. It has, okay. So, so how can you prove the, okay, there's two things. Person A, a thousand years ago, had this experience and told people about it versus person A a thousand years ago did not have this experience and told people about it. And How, the wait, third. Okay, he didn't have this experience. Didn't he have lied. The experience, he lied. lied. Okay. And person A thinks that they had the experience 
even though they didn't, a hallucination, whatever, mm -hmm. and told people about the experience. How can you distinguish between those three in an individual's mind a thousand years in the past? I'm okay with people, and wait, hold on, what individual's mind? The individual who's reporting this experience. In the, so the individual who is talking about the, these other guys over here, the, the ones that either hallucinated, that either lied, or? No. Person A. Uh -huh. Sorry, sorry, I, I don't no, mean no, to no. be difficult. Person A may, had an experience and told people, uh -huh. or person A had, I believe they had an experience, but are mi misrepresenting it. it. It was a hallucination, an optical hallucination, whatever. Person B, or person A again, didn't have the experience, but says they did. Yeah. And now a historian, a thousand years in the future, looks back. How does, the, how does the historian tell which of those versions of person A is actually correct? Because historians don't make proclamations about truth. They just tell you what probably happened. So the evidence the, that I presented that step one is just what they claimed. The, it, the evidence, right, well, hold, hold, let, me get th let me get through it. Okay. So, so um, it's not a claim in step one that they didn't hallucinate or any of that. So you're going, okay, so let's look at step two now. We grant the claim that they were saying that yes. Jesus appeared to them. Uh, how can a historian tell us they weren't hallucinating? I didn't appeal to hallu uh, hallucinate, excuse me, I didn't appeal to a historian to get rid of the hallucination hypothesis. How do we know that they weren't lying? That case was built on how they lived their life and how they were transformed, which we do have historical evidence for. So if somebody lived their life in an honest way, you can tell that they're not lying about this other thing. People tend not to die for what they know is a lie. Oh, that's nonsense. People die, it doesn't matter whether, no, no, no. You don't get to, you don't get to do for what they know is a lie. Mm -hmm because there's no evidence that they necessarily knew it was a lie. They, people will die for what they, first of all, people have died for knowing a lie, but people will die for what they believe. That's independent of whether or not what they believe is true. The apostles knew whether they had this experience or not. Maybe they thought it was, maybe it was a hallucination. Time's up? No, you got it. Oh, so maybe it was a hallucination, um, but well, I guess what, well, backing up, I mean, I, I don't know, sorry, what are you saying? So. No, it's, it's fair. Um, a person says, I had this experience. A thousand years later, a historian picks up that document and says, okay, I'll accept that they claim to have had this experience. I don't know anything about the specifics of the experience other than what they've said. Mm -hmm. I can't confirm that it was a visitation from a god or, or what. We, we don't know. But I can't know whether or not they're being honest or not because I can't interview them. So I can look at the other facts around their life. And what you pointed out was that if they are honest in these other areas, we assume that they're honest on this. And no, no, I think, no, no, that's, that's, okay. that's confusing. The so then why point out how honest they are in other areas if that's not relevant to whether or not they're honest on this? You're confusing two different honesties. The honesty having to do with the reports was just to get us step one of Luke and stuff. That was just step one. But wait, hold, hold on. In, we're talking about step two now, and we're talking about the honesty of the reporters the, of, of sure. the apostles themselves. And the case for the honesty of the apostles themselves is that in the midst of them proclaiming that Jesus appeared to them in this way, they lived a particular way that suggests they were absolutely convinced. Something transformed them into believing that Jesus is alive, and they were proclaiming, yes, he, he appeared to us. And they, they were telling all their friends and family that he appeared to them. They weren't, again, like I pointed out earlier, they weren't trying to mislead the world. They had nothing to get out of it. They, they, they sacrificed did. everything. To, they, mm -hmm. they got martyrdom. Okay, what's the problem? See, the, the, the reason I ask is, is to say that they got nothing out of it. I'm fine with the idea that the individuals were trying to present what they believed to be true. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying that they were all liars. As a matter of fact, they so, might So they own believed own that Jesus appeared to them? I have no problem with the idea that they may have believed this. I don't necessarily know that all of them necessarily believed it, because what happens is I'm in a group of 12 people, and uh, the head honcho comes in and says, Jesus appeared to me, and somebody else says, Jesus appeared to me too, and I believe the same things that they all believe, and I see the importance and value of pushing forward this religion. I might be inclined to say, Jesus appeared to me too. I don't know. I'm, I'm not necessarily saying that's the case. I'm just saying you can't rule that out. But the fact that they were willing to die for something doesn't tell you anything at all about whether or not what they were willing to die for is true. I, I grant you. I mean, you know, people will okay. crash into the Twin Towers. It doesn't mean what they believe is true. 
obviously. Yeah. I, um, and I that's not, and I wouldn't say that. that. Reference, <laughs> we'll take it. Uh, yeah. Um, so I, I grant you that. And so let's let's back up here to the situation that you tried to paint earlier, because that's okay. ultimately. I mean, I sent you this question over over Facebook because I didn't want to spring it on you. But my big yeah. question tonight is to try to explain, or try to get get you to help me think of an uh, a, the best naturalistic explanation, whether it's true or false, it doesn't matter. Sure. Let's just you know, and you just did a second ago. Well, you gave one. Um, kind of. My thing is. So go ask the question so that the, I'm not leaping well, the, ahead because well, you asked me in Facebook. Yeah, the, no, the question yeah. is, I mean, let's flesh it out. Let's think about it. Um, so uh, can, the hypothesis is that one person uh, wasn't lying. He had a real experience, and then he said, Jesus appeared to me, and then other people started saying he appeared to me to lie about it, and they were giving their lives for it, or what? what what's the deal? No, no, the question that you were asking was assume that the apostles uh, believed that they had experiences with a ris risen Jesus. Oh, okay. That was that was the question. Well, no, originally you were you were mentioning lying, but if you say that no, they no, really I, believed I'm it, they weren't the lying. You, you said you said you asked me on Facebook. I thought they were the, talking, talking about. Oh, on on Facebook. If I did, it was, but I just got your text. <laughs> uh, no. Okay. So uh, your your question was: assume that the apostles had an experience. Genuinely believe. Yes, genuinely you're right. Genuinely believe that they had an experience with the risen Jesus. Good, good. Okay. Do you have a natural ex naturalistic Yeah, experience? what's the best we can come up with? So first I'd point out, I'll never make that assumption. I don't think it's a fair assumption to make. But for the sake of argument, let's make the assumption. Okay. For the sake of argument, before I offer any naturalistic explanation, let's say we could find no naturalistic explanation for that. Mm -hmm. Are they? Are we then warranted in accepting supernatural explanations? Again, I'm a Bayesian, so it's a complex equation. And I said, in fact, I said in my in the final part of my statement. I mean, for example, if you are convinced that no God exists, then there's no one to raise Jesus, and so Jesus would have to raise naturally, which is you know well, absurd. Let's say I'm not convinced there's no God, and I'm not convinced there Five is minutes. a God, and I'm just looking at the facts of this situation, and I can't come up with a natural explanation. Am I, am I then justified in, in accepting a supernaturally proposed explanation? Okay, so if you're, agnostic about, if you're agnostic about God's existence and you grant that Jesus existed, the final question would be how likely is it that God would choose to raise Jesus? That would be the last part of the background Why knowledge. Why would that be the question? Because if you have God's existence and Jesus' existence, if God chooses to raise Jesus, then it entails that Jesus gets risen. Well, sure, but if, I, if, you, begin, if you get to begin with presuming God, then why don't I get to begin with not presuming, I didn't. It's, presuming it's, no God? I said agnostic, so you're agnostic about it. Okay, okay, I'm just saying, if you're agnostic about it, then you're not presuming God. Right, you're not presuming, but okay. this becomes a big challenge to the resurrection if you have good reason, if you're absolutely convinced that no God exists, then the resurrection becomes insanely improbable. Okay, if well, you're no, just no, no, agnostic... I don't see how the probability of an event is affected in any way by the beliefs of the people who are assessing it. If your view of Bayesian analysis is such that whether or not I believe a God exists affects the Bayesian probability of a resurrection, I don't want, I don't, not, I don't think, thank you. It, uh, are you having you. fun? <laughs> so good to see you again. She asked a question during our last debate. We'll see if it happens again. Um, you, no, where are you at? And that's her sister. And she didn't come tonight? She's here. Okay, good. Ask me a question. Yay. Uh, sorry. Um, if, so Bayesian analysis shouldn't be contingent upon what the people doing the analysis so you, believe. So you don't think uh, you're likely, you're, um, the likelihood that you assign to the proposition that God exists, you don't think the likelihood of God's existence is relevant to whether a miracle occurs? Do I think the likelihood of God's existence? Yes, the likelihood of God's existence is relevant to whether a miracle occurred, but the, that has nothing to do with my belief about God. I, I, I'm not saying it has anything to do with a belief about God right now. What I'm saying you is, did. is that you no, said if you, hold if on. you have this belief. What, what I said was that, is that if you if you're very confident that God doesn't That's exist, true. then all of a sudden the likelihood of a miracle is far lower than someone who does believe God exists. That's about what my analysis of a situation would be. I'm talking about if we're going to try to do the Bayesian probability of a resurrection. Okay, let's, let's go back to your... How do we, how can we ever say mm -hmm. that our failure to identify a naturalistic explanation warrants accepting a supernatural one? I think that's a complex equation because I'm a Bayesian, so... And I think it's really, really simple. I don't see how this is an argument from ignorance fallacy. It is an argument from ignorance fallacy. It is simply saying that 
because we don't have a naturalistic explanation, we can then be warranted in accepting a supernatural explanation. And I don't think you can accept any supernatural, any explanation, minutes. natural or supernatural, until you have a demonstration that that is actually a possible or probable explanation. Otherwise, no. if we can't find a naturalistic, naturalistic explanation, then the warrant on the supernatural God raising dead is exactly the same as a supernatural group of pixies raising from the dead, etc. I would, I would never say that just because I don't know that therefore God did it. I'm not making an ignorant, I don't think I'm making an, an argument from ignorance fallacy. I think what I'm doing is I'm saying, look, we have a piece of data here. It fits really, really well on the hypothesis that God raised Jesus from the dead. It fits and this, really, really well with pixies and this same Jesus. And this same evidence is insanely unlikely under the hypotheses that you've been trying to pull out, whether it's hallucination or whatever. And that's a reason why the data, namely that the apostles really believe Jesus appeared to them, counts as evidence for the resurrection over these naturalistic hypotheses. You mentioned pixies, you're right. So we could suppose, in fact, let's get more specific than God. Suppose okay. we have a super deity whose only uh, purpose for existing is to trick the world into believing a man rose from the dead. That would, on that hypothesis, Jesus' resurrection is even better the difference is you've moved the improbability to this new entity. This entity is, in, is far more improbable than God's simplicator. And this is, sure. why, this is why your background knowledge is, is extremely relevant. You have to ask how likely it is that God exists or that this particular entity exists. How likely is it that God exists? I think the likelihood is very high. I don't, I mean. I don't know how you calculate probabilities for and, things are, are, you can't and, investigate, but it's your question time, so. We so, so, so let's flush out um, um, what you're talking about. Let's just do our oh best. Oh my gosh, we're going to get to substance dualism in the last minute of the question. Last question. <laughs> last question. Last question. So just uh, fl flush it out for me. So the idea that you had, uh, if the apostles had this experience, is that um, what? No, my, my idea, is, first of all, I don't accept that the apostles necessarily had these experiences. What I view the story as is uh, an unreconcilable mix of legend where I can't distinguish. But the question but is granted. If we were to assume that the apostles had this experience, what naturalistic explanations could I offer? This is why when I talked about um, this idea that we need one explanation is false. For each of the individual accounts, they might have different explanations. Just do your best. Um, one of them might have had, uh, we know people have religious visions for other religions that are uh, ostensibly, we think, when, when we can investigate them, caused by uh, brain trauma or some sort of malfunction in the brain. People see visions and hallucinations. I think that this is plausible to account for some of them, perhaps. Um, we also know that um, we could have naturalistic explanations for others. I don't think that, they, that I could come up with a naturalistic explanation for all of them. But and, and as a group. All of them or each individually. There may be, yeah. how do you come up with a naturalistic explanation for Jesus appeared to the unnamed 500? Well, I'm going to say I don't because I don't think that ever happened. I understand. So we're, we're, we're working on the yeah. assumption that all historians are right and that they really were proclaiming no, this. No, I, I will not work on the assumption that all historians are right because I find that to be an ex hyperbolic in the extreme. It's, I'm going, it's not. Okay. I mean, aside, okay, so we have a couple, we have like four Richard existing. Richard Carrier is a historian. I was about to say, we have four existing, four existing I, I, I'm just We have, saying. hold on, we have Richard Carrier, we have, uh, last who, question, last who, question. we have uh, last Robert last Price, question. we have four, and you just named one of them. There's only mythicists, those four mythicists out of all historians would say something like that. And only, you just, you went only, straight to them. Only, hang on. <laughs> I went straight to them because you said all. And I can point to something that doesn't make it all. In my so opening can we statement, acknowledge that it's not all. Y yes, in my opening statement, that's I say, it, I all say, all, all teaching professors. So I should, I should add that in. So neither of those guys are oh. professors, and that's normally what I say. Sure. So my that, apologies. <coughs> Done. That will conclude cross examination. Yay! Thank you both, Blake Genta, Matt Delahunty. I'm, uh, I'm we will take. We will take a 10 minute break and then transition to Q&A from the floor. Please visit the bar, or more importantly, the restroom, and we'll see you back in 10 minutes. Q&A, tonight's topic is, did Jesus rise from the dead? This is a continuum of that. This is where I invite you to offer your challenges, what's been said. Your question should be no longer than two minutes, and Jermaine, to tonight's topic.
The topic queries that are off will be dismissed. Questions over here will be for Dillahunty. They switch seats. No, 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 we switch seats so that they can stay where they were. Okay. So that I'm looking at this question here and Blake's looking at that. Okay. okay. Questions over there for Blake. Yeah. Questions over there we for Mr. Dillahunty. All I ask, two minutes or less. We also have a pretty enormous amount of questions from our live stream audience that, have, that have been submitted. Out. You know, polite is very subjective. <laughs> sound like that. <laughs> yeah. We'll start here. Question for Blake, two minutes. Uh, Blake, uh, I'm Bruce Turk. I'm a Fort Worth proud member of the Metroplex Atheist, and uh, glad to be here tonight. Uh, I have a question for you, and it has to do with something Matt touched on, and that was the issue of legend making. Uh, Acts chapter 2, very seminal primitive, primal uh, sermon preached by Peter, where Jesus is simply described as a man approved of God. And in verse 24 of that, uh, of Acts chapter 2, it stated that God raised from the dead. So obviously, Jesus was somebody that God acted upon and raised from the dead. That is the testimony of every single gospel writer and Paul. Why is it that the further you get from Jesus' uh, ministry, uh, as is specifically the Gospel of John, which is the ultimate gospel in terms of its chronology, that Jesus now has the ability to raise himself from the dead because every single reference in the Gospel of John where Jesus talks about his resurrection, he says, I will raise myself from the dead. How did Jesus evolve from this person who Simply, someone approved by God that God raised from the dead to this person who now has this God-like ability to raise himself from the dead. And why is that not evidence of legend making? So I don't think your sample size, I think there are like three verses that cover Jesus' statement, God will raise me from the dead and I will uh, raise Paul myself from the dead. The uniform testimony of Paul, the gospel writers, and the book of Luke. Just, okay, just so you know. Um, uniform. Right, and I think from the beginning, Jesus considers himself God. Remember, so Paul is very clear. Oh, okay. Yeah, so uh, I do. I believe that Jesus considered himself God. But that's not what the text, the text say in, I, in Paul the, and in all of the Gospels. Well, in Paul, Paul, no, Paul. Is the object Paul of calls God's active work to resurrect him from the dead. Paul and Paul, Jesus now says in the book of John, I can raise myself. So Paul. But answer the question. Okay, so the answer is that Jesus considered himself God. Paul called him called Paul called Jesus God several times. So and Jesus, Jesus doesn't know the difference between I and, and I'm a Trinitarian. So so uh, so I'm a Trinitarian, and what that means is that I believe that God is three persons and one being. This question is actually for both of you, um, <clears throat> cheater. Yeah, I mean it's it's uh, no, go, go. okay. How do you what what would you say to the claim that it it was a hallucination, but that it was some kind of drug induced hallucination? That what was a hallucination? That their their experience of witnessing Jesus being resurrected was a hallucination, but it was drug induced. Any Apart any. From Jesus. It, so. So there's a bunch of different uh, claims of witnessing this. So I'm assuming what you're asking is, take any one of those, how would you respond to somebody saying it was a drug-induced claim? I, I, my response would be, prove it. I, 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 I'm not saying that it's not, but I need more than just somebody saying, oh, it was a drug-induced thing. This is why I don't buy in. There's lots of, one of the things that happens in the secular community that frustrates the crap out of the theist community, is, and by the way, it frustrates me, is that there are a number of atheists and secularists who go way, way, way too far. Oh, there's nothing good here. It's, a, it's an invented fiction. This was a drug. That, this hyperbolic exaggeration is if they need to do that, when all they really need to do is say, they haven't actually made their case. Um, I can't 
reasonably confirm a supernatural resurrection, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to go with the Yahoo who says, oh, this is all, this is all drug stuff, man, DMT, try it. You know, I can't do that either. Um, every claim needs to be established with evidence. And it does us, does us, atheists listen up, it does us no good to say, oh, that's all crap, it's a fiction invented in the fourth century by the Pope and the Masons. That's garbage because you can't prove it. And what's more, you don't need to prove that because the burden of proof is on the claim that there was a God and that these events happened the way Christianity and Christendom represents it. So the argument that I presented tonight, just to put this in context again, was right. that step one, the apostles uh, were proclaiming that Jesus just appeared to him, just appeared to us. We just saw him. Um, and then step two was knocking out these naturalistic explanations, the best ones that we can come up with. And uh, this would be part of going after step two, and they'd say, okay, well, let's look a little bit closer at the hallucination hypothesis. Maybe we can increase the probability not by saying they're schizotypal, but that they were, um, you know, using mushrooms or whatever. And I actually don't say that we need to know um, the, the correct answer. I wouldn't demand that of Matt that he tell us what actually happened. All I think that is needed in order to refute my argument is just a plausible naturalistic explanation that doesn't sound absurd when you spell it out. It, this particular hypothesis, I think, is going to come off as, as absurd, not just because of the cr mushrooms, but because you're still dealing with them having experiencing the same individual. It happened to Paul, who is not on the mushrooms. It happened to James. I mean, I, I didn't make the case for the empty tomb tonight, but I, I would if I had more time. So it, it has several features that make it implausible as a whole, I think. So wouldn't the idea that, wouldn't, um, wouldn't the explanation of hallucinations be more plausible if they were on drugs rather than all hallucinating sure. the it, same it thing? It would, but this is just like saying it would be more plausible if we posited the existence of a special kind of deity whose only purpose in life was to raise a person from the dead and convince the world. What this does is this transfers the improbability to the background knowledge. So you, yes, you've explained it, you've increased uh, what uh, historians call the explanatory power, but you've decreased the plausibility in doing so, and it's made it even worse. This, this is actually something that we almost agree on, except I was trying to point out the problem that I see in what he's saying, and that is, I don't know how you can claim that a resurrection is plausible or probable. I don't, I don't understand how you can do that when we have zero examples to investigate. It is nothing more than a hypothesis of born of ignorance that we don't have another explanation. And so it would be, it would be wrong fundamentally, even though I will probably say it at some point, uh, to say that drugs, a drug-induced hallucination is more probable than a resurrection. Because the truth is, I have no way to calculate what the probability of a resurrection is, because I have no way to investigate it. So it is out here as like a divide by zero error, if that makes any sense. And all I can do is look at the possible explanations and say, you know what, none of these are really convincing. And I'm OK with saying I have yet to be convinced that we have an explanation. Let me just say something real quick. Whenever Matt's talking about probability, he's using what's called a frequentist interpretation, where you need a number of past examples to see how frequent it is. Whereas when I say probability, I'm talking about this Bayesian understanding where the probability represents this, uh, the degree of belief that you have in it. And we can talk about the probability, for example, um, of that the dinosaurs were wiped out uh, at this particular time, even if there are no prior examples. Because what determines epistemic, epistemic prior prob or probability is something a lot more complex and, and interesting than just frequentist understandings. So, so he and Chris Richard Carrier are both Bayesians. Right. I, I, I'd love to see <laughs> the two of them talk because they've reached completely different conclusions, which is why I'm not a Bayesian. And when you ask me when, when the dinosaurs were not wiped out and why, I'm not going to go to a Bayesian analysis. I'm going to go to the physical evidence. But we, we've gone way afield of your question. Sorry. Okay. My, of course, my question is for you. I don't feel like you, you addressed Matt's explanation. You gave uh, different ex explanations for why you believe the resurrection is true. Like, uh, hallucin uh, there could be, it could have been a hallucination, but it wasn't, or whatever. And his explanation, most probably and reasonably, it was a uh, legend, and which was uh, the person before me. So I'm going to give you a very specific example of a legend. Like in our own timeline, on cameras, uh, Elvis died. But there's still a lot of people who claim to, to cite him. Now, it, they, are, these people believe what they're saying, which is the same thing you're saying about the people, the prophets who believe that they saw Jesus resurrected. 
uh, and there's, there's the explanation that they're liars, but there's also what Matt's saying, that legends happen, we see them happen all the time, and like, uh, it's like a grapevine effect. The more the story gets told, or the game telephone, uh, it, the more it starts to get distorted over time. And now you're talking about a deep time story. So with, uh, but look at Buddha. Buddha was said to have walked on water, and if someone uh, debated that with you, you would say, where's your evidence, right? Mm -hmm. And most likely, that's a, that, that is also a legend. So address the specific um, claim that Matt is making that, you're, uh, that Jesus rising from the dead is a legend. And I know that you said it's the consensus of historians, but how is that not a argument to tradition? Because, because uh, uh, for the longest time, people believed Aristotle that uh, the mat matter was made of four elements rather than atoms, all the way to the 1800s. So how, how do you know, even if there is a supposed consensus, consensus that, that it's not just a reigning paradigm? So there, obviously there's a lot there. First, very quickly, um, the reason why I showed in the beginning uh, that book with those footnotes uh, from those 10 pages and every, half of every page is footnotes and all those footnotes are citing I think it's it, it might be over a hundred uh, peer-reviewed papers published on this first Corinthians 15 creed is because I can't convey everything quickly uh, in a debate this first Corinthians 15 creed that they date back to within three years of the crucifixion they're proclaiming here let me go because I you can't respond right now I'm sorry I got to get through it all because they are proclaiming that Jesus appeared to them um, and we can confirm this. Now, I can't go through all that in a quick debate. And, that's, and there's so much stuff that Matt said that I, haven't, I won't have time to respond to. And I'm sure that Matt wants to say that he won't have time to respond to. And that's just the nature of debate. But the claim, and here's your question, the, Matt's hypothesis wasn't legend. His main explanation of the apostles proclaiming that Jesus appeared to them was that one person hallucinated. And then others were like, okay, we're going to kind of follow in that vein. Um, now, I didn't have time to, to give all my critiques of that, and, and you're saying you disagree, so maybe we can get into that more. But uh, that, I don't think that that was, uh, his explanation was something along those lines. Regarding um, legend, again, I, I'm just going to say we can get back to what the apostles were proclaiming. Um, whatever you're saying is legend, I'm just going to say that, that the information is there. I can't, I can't summarize it. There's so just no way to summarize if it. If there's so. lots of documented evidence for uh, uh, Siddhartha Gautama's existence, uh, the Buddha, uh -huh. does that mean that he walked on water? No. So you're making no, a miracle say. claim on top of the uh, claim of I his don't, existence. I don't think you're representing the argument right. You're least, saying you I'll, rose I'll let the Matt dead. turn over because I know. Well, I, I'll just say for clarity that um, it wasn't my main hypothesis of hallucination. That was in response to a question you had where I was forced to assume for the sake of argument that this is the case. That what, I, what I presented in my initial case was about sound epistemology and skepticism and how I think that legend is the most oh, probable. I thought she was asking about no. what no. the explanation was given that. Okay. No, it was in my actual presentation. But okay. it's, it's weird here because this format, there's not really like a specific rebuttal round. Right. It's not like, you know, presentation, rebuttal, presentation, rebuttal. It's more presentation directed questions, which is where you try to get your rebuttal in. Right. Um, and I, th I like that. I'm fine with that. And I'm fine with, with this as well. And he listed several possibilities for that. And, and, and you left out that he's a legend as one of them that, for the testimony that Jesus resurrected. Sure. Oh, that, you, that Jesus didn't exist, you mean? Oh, no, that Jesus no. rose from the dead. Oh, that Jesus did, didn't rose. And that possibility is, is it was a legend. So a legend is refuted by the fact that this, as far as we can tell, was being proclaimed right from the beginning. That's the whole point of the 1 Corinthians 15 creed in the Acts 2 speech, is we can get back to the beginning. We can do the same with Elvis, is her point. Yes. Shortly after Elvis's death, uh, people were report. seeing and, and doubting that Elvis had died. Um, now, none of us find that particularly credible, but her point was that on a timeline scale, we can see the same thing happening with Elvis. Right. The difference, of course, is when Elvis died for my sins, he didn't come back after a short weekend. So the legend... Uh, Sorry, that's Elvis. an old joke. <laughs> it's not meant to insult people. It just always comes to my mind when we talk about Elvis. <laughs> right, so I, I don't know if you're wanting to propose Elvis as an analog, but if you are, then I'm going to respond. If not, we'll just no, go to the next I, question. I, no, I, Okay. Yeah. Got a lot of people to get to. So I'm sure that you and anybody else that knows charismatic Christians knows that they have visions all the time when they get into their 
ecstatic trances and speaking I, I, tongues. I know as someone who's gone to Pentecostal churches, and my good friend Jerry DeWitt is a former Pentecostal, I know that there are frequent reports of this. There's also reports from Pentecostal charismatic churches of speaking in tongues. And there's a very interesting story that was relayed to me. Um, first of all, we have no way to confirm this speaking in tongues of what it actually is. But in some Pentecostal churches, when you reach a certain age, you're expected to go up on the stage to show that you have now reached the age and are filled with the Spirit, and then you are to speak in tongues. And one of my, this is a friend of a friend's story, sorry. Uh, one of my good friend's best friend had to do this. And when he went up, he stood next to the preacher and he said, uh, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And the preacher looked at him and said, just fake it, we all do. Now I can't confirm that, but I don't think it's unreasonable from what we know from like ancient books, like, uh, books from the 19th century, like Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. Um, what we know from um, uh, witch doctors and, and uh, voodoo festivals and things like that about what happens when you're in this environment in a church and people start having experiences and you have them too. This, this comes up with what I was talking to Blake about. I have no way of confirming what went on in somebody else's mind living right now. I don't know how I could do it for somebody in the past. And so I know that there are people who claim that they have visions. I'm willing to take them at their word that they experience something that they are relaying as a vision. I'm just not willing to take them at their word that their explanation that the source of this vision is supernatural. That needs more evidence. Um, we know from the book of Acts and from the book of Corinthians, too, that the disciples and early Christians had behavior that, you know, by all estimations, mirrors these of these voodoo festivals and these uh, Pentecostals of, of modern day. And when we talk about the resurrection of Jesus, my question is, why don't we talk more about why these Pentecostals that the fact that they are comparable to Pentecostals today. Uh, because I'm not sure that they're completely comparable. Um, I, can't, I can't rule it out. When we talk about hallucinations and visions, all we can talk about is somebody's claiming to have experienced something. We can't get into their head. We don't necessarily know. Um, it's why, why some people have used the term qualia for, as if it's a, an actual thing, which I'm, it, that's a, wow, that's way aside. I never said that, don't go near it. Um, I, I've heard stories from people who are like, hey, my grandfather, after he died, came and visited me when I was asleep and comforted me. And when I woke up, there was a, an impres impression of a butt on the bed. That's happened to members of my family. Now, what actually happened? I don't know. Um, but there's a difference between something happening in a state where somebody's on drugs, been dreaming or half asleep, sleep paralysis, stuff like that. And someone who is saying, I was out for a walk yesterday and my grandpa showed up and told me this, 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 and this. The, the, the essence of those two things are slightly different. And that's why I understand a reluctance to write it off as hallucination. However, it still doesn't mean that it happened or that we have good reason to think it happened. So that's as close as I get. Uh, I'll say a couple things too about this idea because um, it's, rela it's related to that uh, idea from Carrier that we mentioned earlier. Um, it's, it's interesting that the more that we, we could be able to establish that they were kind of charismatic or maybe even had visions, which again, I don't, I don't think we can, um, it actually turns out being an argument against the hypothesis that this is uh, what explains their first experiences because they sharply distinguished uh, between the appearances of Jesus and anything that else, else happened in the future. The appearances stopped after the, the short period of time with the apostles and then a couple of years later with Paul, and it's done. And if these were the type of people you're thinking about, you'd think that they would continue to have these sort of Jesus experiences. And there's also the fact that even for people who are like charismatics, the, the, a group hallucination of this nature where they all, you know, go out giving their life away, convinced that this was actually real and not a hallucination. I just don't think that the analog's there. So, thank you. Question submitted by Aaron from North Dakota. From Matt, there are five alleged historical copies of the Gettysburg Address. Each of them have numerous discrepancies. Should we conclude that there was no Gettysburg Address? No, and if we were talking about discrepancies in the resurrection accounts in the life of Jesus, um, the discrepancies alone shouldn't lead us to the conclusion that none of this happened. <laughs> However, 
the discrepancies are enough to make us doubt what actually did happen and whether or not we have a good understanding of it. The idea that discrepancies in a Gettysburg Address, uh, it's not that we need to throw out the whole thing. I'm not saying that the apostles never existed and Jesus never existed and all this other stuff. Um, also, the type of claim is very different. Um, if we have discrepancies in account of a speech that someone gave, we're now talking about how accurately do we understand the actual content of the speech. And we can say not very accurately, but we can suspect that these sorts of things in here, we can do our best guess. And ultimately, what we understand about the Gettysburg Address isn't all that impactful. To compare that to a claim that there's a guy who preached, who was slaughtered, and then God resurrected him, and this is foundational to what you need to understand and accept in order to determine your eternal fate outside of this universe is a wholly different order of claim than the Gettysburg Address. If the resurrection accounts had zero discrepancies, if we had nothing but one repeated tale without discrepancies, that still would not be enough for us to confirm that a resurrection took place. All, it would be able to, all we'd be able to confirm is that there were people who reported it and believed it. That's it. Yeah, I, I think this is a great question. If I had presented um, more sources j than just the two sources, I would get into the Gospels and get into the Gospel reliability, and I'd spend more time uh, de defending that sort of stuff. So I think this is one of the questions that I would love to ask if that were more close to the case I was making. It's a great question. Because um, that's, well, I'll, I'll just stop there. Yeah, I think it's a good question, but it's not what I built my case on. Even if you want to say the Gospels are completely unreliable, I think that uh, I built my case on two very early sources um, that doesn't even require, just require the Gospels to be reliable at all. Um, but I incidentally do agree with apologists who say that these discrepancies uh, whether they're contradictions or just tensions, in fact, are, is what good history looks like. Um, this is what you find in things like the Gettysburg Address. Uh, Blake, you, uh, <clears throat> you mentioned how uh, shared delusions cannot possibly occur, no matter how many times they've been documented. I've personally uh, been party to at least two of them uh, from personal anecdotal memory, but I, I'll talk about that at a later time. For right now, both you and Matt have mentioned something about the God hypothesis or the hypothesis that Jesus was re resurrected from the dead. Matt has already realized uh, by implication how this doesn't really fit in the term of, of, of a hypothesis. As I understand a hypothesis, it needs to be testable in order to qualify as a hypothesis and there needs to be some way to potentially falsify it. So how do we falsify whether Jesus ever resurrected? So a hypothesis needs to be testable in order to what? You have to potentially falsify it. In order to what? To prove whether it is wrong. So in order for a belief to be rational, it has to be testable? In order for a, a hypothesis to qualify as such, it has to be testable and there has to be a way to potentially falsify it. Okay, so for an order, in order for a hypothesis to be rational, it has to be one that you can theoretically falsify. I'm not saying rational. I'm saying in order to qualify under the term hypothesis, you have it's to have a way to test it and thus falsify it. How do so, we okay, falsify then I, I won't, I, First off, I disagree with that. That's not how we use it. But I'm you sorry, don't, okay, but don't, yeah, that's what it is. So, so one, I disagree with that. But two, let's just pick a different word. If, I mean, fine. The, I, I, I'm sorry, you, you both used the word hypothesis. As I said, Matt kind of walked that back because he realized that doesn't really apply. But you did. So under the term hypothesis, which means that it can be testable and thus potentially falsifiable, how do we falsify that? And if your answer is that we can't falsify that, then I would posit that you cannot call it a hypothesis. Okay, so Matt says he doesn't agree. I'll tell you why I don't agree. Number one, I disagree with how you're defining hypothesis. Number two, all I have to do is say, okay, fine, let's not use the word hypothesis, let's use something else, the proposition that, that we're evaluating. So I, I just, uh, I can stop there. Okay, so if the, the answer then is that you cannot falsify it? And, and, I, and then I'd start asking if you wanted to even get into your definition of hallucination, I'd ask what do you mean by testable? Because depending on what you mean, I might even say that this is testable. I would like to hear how it is testable and then how you can prove whether it is wrong. Okay, I mean, that, that's a really long, that's gonna well, take that, a long that's time. That's part <laughs> of being testable. Mm. If you can't prove that it's wrong, then it's not testable either. If you can't, okay. 
So is your claim right there testable? Yeah, it is. How do you test it? I can verify that what, the, what hypothesis means. I can just pull up the, the definition, a scientific definition of what a hypothesis means to show that it has to be potentially falsifiable. If you don't have a way to prove it wrong, then you can't call it a hypothesis. It's a blind ass guess at that point. Yeah. Oh, so what, you're, what if I go to the dictionary and get a different definition of hypothesis? Good luck. Okay. <laughs> Okay. I, I'm, I'm actually in agreement with Blake. Um, I agree with Aaron that in order for a hypothesis to be useful, it must be testable and falsifiable. But I don't necessarily think that that's the only usage of the word hypothesis that has any value. Otherwise, you couldn't say your hypothesis is unfalsifiable and therefore useless. Um, and I don't really care. I mean, this is, this is now at the point about whether or not we want to label a proposition as a hypothesis. I don't care what you label it. I care whether it's testable and falsifiable, absolutely. I don't care whether or not there's agreement about whether or not that qualifies as a hypothesis when I, I'd say that maybe it qualifies as a really bad hypothesis or an untestable hypothesis, you know, when, as long as there's some additional word. If you, uh, yeah, it's... The, the ultimate question, of course, is, is there a way to test it? Is the resurrection and, and falsifiable? And prove that it's wrong. I think there are lots of uh, propositions that we evaluate the truth of that have absolutely nothing to do with scientific-like testing, all sorts of philosophical claims, including several that you're assuming right here. Yeah. The very utility of science itself, I think, is uh, philosophically grounded. Um, I think all, all of our... Error. Hmm? This is a category error. You can't talk about whether or not a body was raised and say that's in the same category as whether or not you have reason to to doubt or or verify your reason this is these are two different categories of things is there any other outside of the resurrection of jesus is there any other account of another person being raised from the dead which we wouldn't look at and say hmm what's the evidence for this and how could we possibly prove it to put this in the same kind well, of category you mean by testable then yes i think it's testable okay. i think we can look at evidence and well, evaluate it then how could you falsify the, the i'm sorry his thing. That is my question. How would I, you I, I, I don't think uh, propositions in order to be true have to be falsifiable or, or rational to believe. I think that so. I think I, to be rational, it would have to be falsifiable. I, I, again, okay, so how do you falsify that claim that in order for a hypothesis or belief to be rational, it has to be falsifiable? How do you falsify that? So this is a misdirection. No, no, hold on. This, this, is, is, a this, okay. this is an important question. It's it, a misdirection. This direction. is an important question. question. You made a claim. In every conversation with theists, they have to push Aaron. the burden of proof onto their opposition because they can never meet the Aaron, burden your of claim proof. is self-defeating. The claim that a, that a hypothesis is only rational if it's falsifiable is not falsifiable. If it's rational by definition, then it must be supported by, by evidence that you will back it up. You don't have that. We all Hold know on, wait. that you don't have that. A second ago, you were talking then, about falsifiability. Now you just then, changed it. But then it. you shifted it to irrational. In order to be rational, the the, the postulation must be based on prior evidence. If you don't have prior evidence, then you can't make a rational uh, postulation. Okay. There's a lot but of people But then you have to be able to falsify it in order to call it a hypothesis. Yeah, let, there has to be a way to test on. it. Okay. Let's move on to other okay. questions. Thank you. My name is Mark. Hey, Mark. I've been here before. Matt, you had made a claim okay. without any documentary evidence that the Gospels were written pretty much second century. You said that no, First I didn't say second written, century. And then you said Mark was written five to 15 years later, and Matthew was written 40 years after that. Now, if we add those numbers up, we're talking about 100 AD. No, so you're making a mistake, okay? So well, the let me date continue range. Then. Let, let, let's suppose you back it off to age 80 AD, okay? Here's the point there's documentary evidence. Number one, all the ancient theologians of the church wrote that Matthew wrote the first gospel. And it was only contested in the 19th century by theologians who said miracles are impossible, therefore we must come up with a theory to explain how Jesus sure. predicted the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Our theory is that Mark wrote the gospel in 70 AD. Here's the point. There's documentary evidence that Matthew wrote by 41, no, later than 48. Sure, you need to take the that to the, you, the, the question's you, not over. You need to, I don't care during if the it's lifetimes over. of the apostles. I'm trying to save us some time. Eyewitness testimony. Okay. Not of dead people, but of eyewitness testimony. What is your documentary evidence to say that the Gospels were written long after everyone was dead who was an eyewitness? Uh, I didn't, first of all, that's not accurate characterization of what I said. But your, your hypothesis or your claim or your position that these were very early 
you need to take that up with the bulk of New Testament scholars within Christianity because when I go to places like earlychristianwritings.com and other New Testament scholars who are Christians, I use their dates. And by the way, the dates aren't absolutely critical to anything that I said. So if you think Matthew was written just a few years afterwards by an eyewitness and that it was actually a disciple, then you need to take that up with the bulk of New Testament scholars. Excuse me, if you said claim, the bulk no, of his I'm not witnesses done talking were not now. credible. Okay, you go ahead. You just said the bulk of his 45,000 witnesses were not credible. I, no, what I said was what the 45,000 documents. You is, where is your okay. documentary evidence? Are you just going to keep inventing fictions of where what I said? Where is your documentary evidence? I told you what my sources were for the dating. It's not my fault that you don't accept them. Well, and you are free. Well, tell me what your documentary evidence. You said I your just claims provided require you. proof. Where's just, your proof? I just provided you with my source. Go to earlychristianwritings.com. Go to, start at Wikipedia, open up a new international version of the Bible, look up any New Testament scholars where they talk about the dating of early Christian writings, there is substantial disagreement. You misunderstood what I said and went directly to saying that I said they, they were written late in the, in the second century because you made a mistake. The date for, let's say, Mark is in the 40 to 60 range. We put it in a range, not a date. It's, we don't even have the original copies. We don't know who wrote it. We put it in a date range. So if it's 40 to 60, and then we determined that Matthew was written after, and the best scholarly estimates show that Matthew was written somewhere between 70 and 80, then that means that Matthew was written somewhere between 10 years or possibly 30 years afterwards. I didn't, this idea that you have that I went to the worst possible date ranges and claimed that everybody was long dead bizarrely does not reflect what I actually said. My sources are out there. I would ask you perhaps to address your question to Blake to see if he thinks that my dates on the early Christian writings are way out of whack because if we're not very much in disagreement then I think that you'd probably be better off talking to other New Testament scholars about this whose work is what I'm relying on. When I talk about Christianity, unlike a lot of other atheists that you might run across, I don't go out and pick the worst examples. I go out and look for what Christians are saying, what New Testament scholars are saying. If you get up here and misrepresent what I said, the 45,000 sources, my question about the 45,000 sources was specifically how many of those specifically deal with facts of the resurrection. It was not what you portrayed my thing to be. I think, unfortunately, in the process of listening to me this evening, your own biases and feelings about the truth about the Gospels got in the way of listening to what I actually said. And I'm sorry that that happened, but you don't get to sit here and accuse me of saying things that I did not say. I've provided you with the sources. Take it up with them. You yourself. I think you're done. Question submitted from Psy 10 for Matt. How do you know that? How can you question Jesus resurrected when you were just a brain in a vat? <laughs> yeah. So Sai is still getting it wrong. I, I've never said that, or never implied that I can be a brain in a vat. It's just that I can't prove I'm not. Last question this side, Daniel. Hi, Blake. Uh, I have uh, one quick question and then the real question after that. Uh, in uh, that passage from 1 Corinthians that you've been referring to a lot, uh, Paul lists the appearances, and at the end he, he uh, mentions that Jesus appeared to Paul himself. Yeah. Uh, do you believe that that appearance was a physical you could touch the body, throw a rock at it, and hit it, appearance. Oh, uh, to, to Paul? Yes. Yeah. You do, okay. Yeah, I, mean, I, would, I, I wouldn't throw a rock at it. I mean, you could, but I wouldn't. <laughs> All right, so um, in the telling of that story on the road to Damascus uh, in Galatians and in Acts, um, when that story is told, it is also mentioned that the travelers with Paul did not see anybody. So... Do, with that information, are you still going to say that it was a physical Jesus was there, but he wasn't seen by anybody else? And if so, couldn't we uh, not apply that same kind of weird circumstance to all of the other appearances that Paul listed? So, well, or, so are you, um, you're using the reliability of Acts here, so you're thinking that Acts is reporting these accounts reliably. Um, and, in this, and then Paul doesn't mention anything about... Um, any companions in Galatians. 
So he just talks about Jesus. He just talks about a revelation from yeah, Jesus. Should I read it for you? It says it, the people that were traveling with Paul heard a voice but didn't see anything. That's in Acts, right? It's in Galatians. I can no, that's not in Galatians. I, I promise you it's not in Galatians. Well, I have should, the... should we trust Blake because he's been truthful about other things? Or... <laughs> well, okay, in Acts, it, it, we'll, we'll, we'll go with the, what you said. In Acts, it, it said that he had companions traveling with him and they didn't see anybody. Yeah. So could that same kind of appearance uh, where other people that were present didn't see anything, could that also apply it, it to said, the appearances that Paul listed? It says they didn't see anything, but they did hear something. So I but don't know. I don't know what Jesus did, but it knocked Paul off his horse allegedly. But you just it knocked, said that it, Paul down. You you Paul said it was an appearance where you could actually touch the body. So if you could touch the body, shouldn't they have seen it? Unless again, maybe there there was a blinding light. I, I mean, I don't honestly. I don't know what happened. And, and the interesting thing is, like, sort of the oddity of trying to explain what happened is, um, I think, lends to its credibility because there are some even sort of like tensions trying to make sense of what the experience was. It, this is just for Paul. This isn't for the apostles. Um, so something, something happened that appeared, supernatu appeared supernatural to Paul that convinced him that Jesus appeared to him. Yes, I think uh, Jesus appeared to him uh, physically. If he didn't, um, it wouldn't affect really the rest of the case, but I think he did. Um, and, uh, and again, it, it knocked him down, it blinded him, and the apostles reported, or excuse me, the companions reported that they heard it, at least. So I think Matt would say that if it wasn't physical, that would change everything, but I'll, I'll let him comment on that. I, I, don't, I don't necessarily know that that's the case because one of the things when you get to, um, hey, here's this event. It doesn't make sense to us right now. How would Christian X explain this? This is, this is the foundation of like apologetics really is. Since we don't appear to have access to the facts of what happened or access to the mind of God, apologetics is sort of this well, I won't say that. It's sort of this w weird exercise of, hey, what makes the most sense in conjunction with what we already believe about this? And so somebody could say, oh, well, it wasn't, Paul didn't necessarily have a physical interaction with God. It was a spiritual vision, uh, which is fine because this was decades later anyway. And that's kind of what we would expect if Jesus had already, I mean, this was after, you know, the ascension, et cetera. But Paul could have also had a physical uh, interaction with Jesus. And what is set up is, well, God can do anything, so he can just make it so that the people who are with Paul may hear something but don't see it. Um, once you add this, I can do anything uh, entity into the discussions, everything becomes possible, which is one of the reasons why I don't understand why this is genuinely believable. Um, because, you know, talking snakes and blah, 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 and all the things that people would like to scoff because they seem unrealistic. There's nothing so unrealistic about a talking snake once you already accept that there's a God who can do something like that. The question is, do you have any good reason to believe that that is in fact the case? And I don't think there is. Last question for the floor, Byron. Yeah, Matt, uh, thank you for the debate, you guys. Thanks. Um, you have said over and over again that you want evidence for what you believe. Yep. Uh, and that seems to be your basis. Help me understand your, just the nature of your skepticism in general and regarding this in particular. Um, it seems to me that what you're doing is going into an endless regress, like, like all skeptics do, I believe, an endless regress of skepticism. No, actually, I presuppose um, the foundations of reason, identity, non-contradiction, exclude middle. I presuppose that I actually because I don't see any potential solution to hard solipsism, I presuppose that I actually exist in a reality, a shared reality with other people. Um, those are the foundational presuppositions for my worldview. They're a matter of practicality. I can't demonstrate that they're true. Um, they, everybody that I interact with pretty much seems to agree that they're true, whether any of us can demonstrate it or not. Mm -hmm. And from what I can tell about my life, I seem to be stuck dealing with a reality in where those are unavoidably uh, true to the point that if I acted in opposition to them, I would be dead. Okay. And those are the two foundational ones. There are others that come uh, later. Some are, are directly, some are directly derived in the same way that you would directly derive mathematics from the foundations of logic. Some of them are indirectly derived. Um, it's, I, I don't have an infinite regress because okay. because of that foundation, okay. but. 
there's a quote from Sagan on religious issues where someone was complaining about the possibility of an infinite regress. And we understand intellectually that you, you can't get there. I mean, right. yeah. But the argument was essentially, oh, if we don't stop here, we're going to have an infinite regress. And uh, it's just going to ask question after question after question after question. And Sagan's response was, so why stop asking questions? Yeah. And that's fine to keep, you, I'm, even the presuppositions that I have that are foundational, I am perfectly willing to question them and have someone point out to me that those presuppositions are wrong. It's just that I don't think I've ever met anybody or even heard of anybody who doesn't agree. Uh, there are some who, who you know, have their different views about solipsism, but I think generally the, can, the view is we can't prove hard solipsism false, so we're stuck acting in this reality. Like if I'm in the matrix, right. until somebody shows me not only that I'm in there and a way out, mm -hmm. I mean, if they showed me that I'm in the matrix and, they're, and give me no way out, I still have to follow the matrix rules unless I'm Neo, which is, by the way, that's a crap, like kindergarten-y philosophy thing, but Well, I, I appreciate that explanation very much. Um, let me get your reaction to this. Sure. Um, evidence is, seems to be the critical thing, of course, in this, doc, in this uh, discussion. The evidence of personal experience, I think, can be easily uh, blown away or questioned or whatever. But it seems to me that, and this gets into the hiddenness of God and all that kind of thing. Why is it more obvious and all of that? But the divine hiddenness is something he and I have dis discussed in the past. Yeah. Oh, yeah, go well, that's, that Sorry, could, go ahead. could be endless. Um, the, the claim of scripture is, in two places, taste and see that the Lord is good and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Mm -hmm. We tried to make a pun out of Dillahunty on that, and it didn't work. But those who diligently seek it. React to the question, have you ever diligently sought him for an evidentiary experience that would actually uh, render all of those debates, at least in a different light, more probable? Sure. Okay. Yeah, and this, and I don't mean... I promise you, I am not doing this to slight you in any way. There's another version of this question up that came up in a debate that I did in Canada. And it was two ministers who both bought into this idea that God will definitely reveal himself to anyone who sincerely and diligently seeks him. And because they believe that, then clearly I didn't do that. And my response to them was, I don't know how anybody could have spent, been more sincere and diligent in a pursuit. Um, I'm sure there are people who may have been, but I'm also well aware of people who claim to have this revelation and experience of God, who I can say with extreme confidence spent nowhere near the sincere, diligent effort I did. And the idea, people would ask me, have asked me, what would change your mind? And I always say now, I don't know, but if there's a God, God knows what would change my mind, and he hasn't done that, so either he doesn't exist or he doesn't want me to know he exists yet. But, but the other thing about this is the very idea, uh, pe people will say, well, God won't you know, reveal himself to you because it would violate your free will. Uh, I don't want to get into the, the free will discussion, but the fact of the matter is there could be a God who would reveal himself to me right now and I would stop being an atheist based on the evidence of this revelation, but that doesn't mean that I would like or worship or respect that God because it could be a moral monster from my perspective. If the contention is that there is a God who if I diligently seek him in whatever way he wants, which evidently I haven't been successful at despite attempts, whatever that God wants me to do would almost have to be absurd considering the efforts that I have, which you can't demonstrate to anybody. For all you know, I'm sitting here making shit up. Um, but I would hold that that God is a moral thug, that a God who wants to interact with you can and cannot be stopped from interacting with you. And a God who loves you and wants you to know that he exists could not possibly have had me as a believer intent on fulfilling what I thought was what God wanted to become a preacher, reach out desperately to God to help me, to guide me, to give me the evidence, and said, nope, you're not sincere enough. 
That God is something that I want nothing to do with if he does exist because I don't find him to be a moral being. Fortunately, I don't think he does exist. And that's the problem of, well, it gets us to the problem of divine hiddenness, which we will be on for ages. And and I I appreciate that response so much. I I don't believe that the actual gospel, the good news, the scriptural, historical, orthodox faith would say that your sincerity level is the issue. Um, And that would be unfair. Um, The the weird thing is I have a pastor friend in, in Austin who is convinced that I was actually saved, and because he believes in once saved, always saved, he's going to see me in heaven. Uh, and until well, that be a surprise, it, it'll be a shock. Uh, and I'll say, hey, hey. But this is one of the one of the aspects of this is that it's too long to get into. I apologize. This is it, a lot. Of it's a lot. Thank you both. Do you have a? Yeah, I'll just say something quickly, um, which is related say to. Say I'm going to hell, please. <laughs> Will Matt. Be perfect. You know, um, Hey, no jeering from the crowd, even on the last question. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, uh, I mean, so I kind of, as I explained at the end of my opening statement that I had to rush through very quickly, um, I, I believe that at the end of the day, God wants two things. On the one hand, he wants people to freely love him and worship him, um, and he wants to eliminate all of evil. And if you have someone who is not going to freely submit in that way, who's not going to say, God, transform me and make me your own, let, let uh, you can be in control, Lord, uh, you are good. If you're not willing and ready to make that, then God doesn't have a reason to bring you to belief or to ensure that you believe. And so, anyways, I've got a, a long section on divine hiddenness at beliefmap.org, and, and Matt and I have talked about it before. So if, if you're yeah, interested, I, I that's think, a, I think the point that I made in response to that last time was if I was God and I wanted to get rid of evil, evil would have already been gotten rid of. I mean, what, well, then, what's going to stop then, me? Then you take, because then you can stop. I mean, God, again, the whole, it, the answer that I was giving is, is God still wants to give, God wants people to freely love him. He wants free moral agents. And if you have free moral agents, then you have to be open to the possibility that sin is going to get into your world and evil. Yeah, That's but this, what happens. This raises the question of why you want free moral agents and, and why you need uh, excessive evil. And, and, but I do. Now I, think, I think free, exce- uh, to be loved freely is, we'll is valuable. We'll be here for a month. <laughs> But we'll do this again. We'll do other stuff. Yeah. I still want to get to substance dualism in a hangout. Sorry, Ezra, it's your turn. Closing statements, Mr. Delahunty. Oh, closing statements. Uh, first of all, thank you all for coming, and, and thanks to BBC for having me out. Um, I, uh, I, I, I genuinely like Blake and have from our first debate, which was also a BBC event, despite the fact that we disagree on things. Now that may not last. I've, I've lost friends over stuff in the past, so maybe we'll, maybe we'll hate each other in a month or two. Who knows? Uh, but I like I like the conversation. I like making people think. I like being made to think. Uh, I like considering the questions because I think they're important. It's bizarre to me that people would not give a damn about a belief that is shared by a, a, such a huge portion of the population of the planet Earth. It's also bizarre to me um, because I cannot accept without without good warrant appeals to the supernatural. And so the Doyle fallacy of, hey, we have these claims, I can't think of a naturalistic explanation, therefore a supernatural explanation becomes more probable from a Bayesian sense or whatever. I cannot buy that. Because to me, the answer at that point is very obviously, I don't know what the explanation is for this. I'm not even sure I have all the facts. But what kind of a God would set up this bizarre scenario? This to me doesn't even make sense from a theological standpoint, even though I freely admit it did make sense to me back when I had, as Seth Andrews would say, my God glasses on. And I can try to put them back on, and I can, I can play apologist. Uh, I don't like to, because sometimes I'm better at it than some of the apologists. And also sometimes I don't honestly represent things because I can only see them as I see them now in some cases. But if there's a God who set up this situation where he needed to come down in human form and sacrifice himself to himself to serve as a loophole for rules that he had so that he was actually capable of loving the fallen creatures that he had, according to the book, set up to fail from the beginning, I have questions about the moral character of that God, in completely aside from whether or not the events occurred. But when we have 
a collection of anonymous texts that are copies of copies of translations of copies. It doesn't matter to me if every credible historian on earth, which is already Weasley language, every teaching historian on earth, which is additionally Weasley language, it is cherry picking out the ones that are in agreement. I'm fine with consensus, but it doesn't matter to me if they all have determined that yes, the best explanation for this is a resurrection. I couldn't possibly believe that because I understand that history by its methods can't confirm a resurrection. I also don't see how it could confirm what Blake seems to say it's confirming that they are able to actually get into somebody's head and determine that, they ha that what they have on a piece of paper from 2,000 years ago actually represents what the ultimate source of that thought honestly believed and experienced. There are too many hurdles to overcome, whether you accept that Jesus existed, that we have an accurate method, uh, record of his words and deeds, that our, our recordings about what was said is true. There are too many question marks and when you multiply doubt, you cannot get to certainty. And for, for the handful, and this isn't everybody, but for the handful of believers who know that they know that they know that they know that Jesus is risen and Lord, that has to be hyperbole. That has to be compensation. Because there is clearly, at a minimum, very reasonable doubts about this claim that we debated this evening. Thanks. So um, I want to share with you an opening statement that I, I prepared, and Matt didn't bring up this particular uh, idea as much, but it did show up, and it's this uh, broad idea that I think um, uh, drives uh, sort of Matt's understanding and his, and his way of approaching reality. He talks about uh, how, producing a method, and that in order to rationally believe something, you need to follow this very particular method, and part of that method um, is methodological naturalism, and that, that's this idea right, that uh, any explanation that is uh, one that we can rationally accept needs to, at least right now, be one that uh, is uh, delivered in terms of mentioning natural entities and natural laws. Um, and I just wanted to finish by saying, as a Christian, I love methodological naturalism in the sciences. The Christians who worked it out since the beginning loved it too, uh, because it's a great heuristic. But I, I don't stop there. Um, so I was going to show you guys some geological structures that looked designed uh, that have fooled us. Um, and because they can even fool geologists, I also endorse met methodological geologism. For geologists, um, when, when a geologist sees Stonehenge, I don't think he should be allowed to conclude it was designed as long as he's doing his work. That's not his job. It's an important heuristic because it prevents him from giving up too soon. And in the same way, I don't think scientists in general should be allowed to conclude a miracle. It's not his job. Uh, these higher order decisions, I think, go to philosophers with the requisite training. Anyway, so I love methodological naturalism, methodological geologism. I even like methodological biblical inerrancy um, in seminaries because they force us to look hard for answers and not give up early. But if you make them your full-blown epistemology, you're sabotaging your quest for truth. I found that people who take their methodological naturalism or methodological inerrancy out of their intended environments usually do so having fallen through the same three steps. Let me illustrate just with methodological inerrancy and methodological naturalism. So step one, both start with the good fruits of the track record of the method they're proposing. The methodological naturalist is going to say, look, assuming naturalism, we've experienced great success in learning various truths about nature, like how uh, riverbed XYZ was formed. Even people who believe in miracles grant this success. And in the same way, for the methodological naturalist, assuming biblical inerrancy, we have experienced a great success in learning various truths about the Bible. Paul did this or that, or this city was attacked. And even people who, be who believe the Bible's full of errors grant this success. For step two, then they both start talking about the failure of alleged anomalies. So the methodological naturalist will say, well, there are, the, there are all these stories where we thought that uh, maybe we confirmed an instance of a non-natural entity or event, and we got burned for it, right? So we thought lightning or volcanoes were caused by gods, and we were mistaken. Uh, let's not get burned again. And the methodological inerrantist will tell the same story. He's going to say, look, there are all these stories uh, where maybe we thought that we confirmed an error in the Bible, and we got burned for it. But uh, 
uh, then we turn around and we see, look, uh, David and Solomon, who were thought unhistorical at first, we confirmed them. Uh, we thought Acts was unreliable, and then we confirmed that it was. So we've similarly got a history of it doing well. And from these two things, both parties then perform uh, this amazing inference fallacy, I think, that destroys them both. Um, they both say, therefore, this is our only reliable method. Only it has this track record, and they both become anomalophobic, meaning to them anomalies are now unacceptable. And it turns into this self-affirming spiral because every anomaly can be systematically dismissed now. So um, uh, I'm going to list a, just a few quotes that, uh, that you'll occasionally hear from Matt in talking about the supernatural. Um, but I'm going to replace methodological naturalism with methodological inerrancy. So category one are statements that you heard tonight where um, he says that this is just an argument from incredulity. Okay, so this is where the narratist would come in and say, I, well, you're just saying that I don't know, therefore it's an error. That's how he would do it. Um, then there's category one statements which say that there's just no way to verify the given anomaly. Right? The, the idea that the Bible has an error isn't testable. It can't be verified. Remember the stories of when we thought it had an error and we were burned. So you have to demonstrate that it's possible for the Bible to have an error before demonstrating that it actually has an error. And then category three statements talk about our standards of evidence, where truth should be able to meet these standards of methodological biblical inerrancy. But when we say standards, that is what we mean. We just mean the very thing that we were supposed to be confirming. So anyways, um, I, I wanted to conclu conclude just saying I do hear people saying that Matt is biased and that he's preventing himself from truth. And I don't know if I agree. Um, I suspect that Matt is perfectly intellectually honest, and um, my only... My thought is that he's put himself in a, a method that has prevented him unwittingly from coming to truth. My only hope is that he could uh, see that uh, this is sort of, again, an, an anomalophobia. And uh, anyways, that's, that's what I had for you guys. Thank you so much for coming out. I really appreciate it. Um, Y'all are great. This video is made possible by supporters of the Atheist Debates Patreon project. You can find more information and add your support at patreon.com slash atheistdebates.